Hello and welcome to a special episode of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 217, August Q&A. Which is just a temporary title to be replaced after we find out what we're actually going to be talking about tonight. Well, I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record all of our podcast episodes live on Twitch, Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and we love when folks join us. So Deanna and I have been out of town for a couple of days and then had guests visiting us today. So I didn't have time to prep for a normal podcast episode. So today we're taking it easy by opening up the floor to the awesome folk joining us here live and hosting a live Q&A. After that, we've got a longer than usual bellhops tabletop as I got in a lot of gameplays in the last week. I'm well out of town, including first thoughts on the Crowns and Quests expansion for Castle Panic. Yes, that is the new one, the, the shiny new expansion for that, the first new expansion for years. Um, first thoughts on Distilled, more plays of Kapow, games of Deadlies, Tapple, and more. For those of you watching live, you can kind of see the pile behind me. Those are all games we'll be talking about tonight. After the show is recorded, there will be a set of show notes where you can find the links to the games mentioned, any past episodes or articles we call out, and more. Find that at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 217. Now, links found there may be affiliate links which help support this show, and I'm also sure some of the games mentioned tonight will have been provided for review by publishers. Let's start off with a usual trip to the suggestion box. Welcome to this week's suggestion box. Here we share some of the feedback and comments we've gotten on our content. Well, let's start off with a comment on our Outsmarted review from friend of the show, Chris Groff. He says, if I actually liked trivia games, this does sound like it hits all the points I want, but I just have no love for trivia games. I totally get it, Chris. That's exactly where I am with this game. It fixes so many problems with trivia games, and it's better than any other trivia game I played. But in the end, it's a trivia game. I do still recommend this one for anyone who does like trivia games. And for you folk, remember, you get 10% off using our code bellhop if you head to outsmarted.ca for Canada, outsmarted.co for the US, and .co.uk for the UK. Note, in the U.S., it is not outsmarted.com. That goes somewhere you don't want to go. It's .co. Well, next we have David North, who commented on our article that talked about the difference between Euros and Amerithrash games. David says, Great explanation, Mo. I have often scratched my head when running into detail-obsessed advocates of specific games. Hmm. My bottom line is, games should be first, fun, and second, exciting. The rest is just detail. Yeah, I get it, David, and I know Sean agrees with you totally, but people do like to put things in buckets, and when someone is just learning about their hobby, they will hear these terms tossed around all over the place. So we're just trying to help people get some idea of what people are talking about and remove some of the barriers to entry. At this point, though, these terms really should be tossed out. There is so much overlap in other genres of games and other types of games that really it's a total false dichotomy nowadays. Well, next, we've got a recent comment on our Disney Sidekicks review. Now, Kingdom Come 811 says, We bought this as my daughter loves board games. My wife and I had a couple of playthroughs to get the rules and mechanisms down, and we were honestly shocked at how difficult it is to win. Fairly straightforward to understand and play, but the lose conditions all too readily come around. Well, thanks for the comment, Kingdom Come. Um, first, congrats on at least figuring out the rules. Uh, you got a step further than many parents did. And I'm sorry you ran into the same problem we did. This game is just wicked hard. We've had games where we lost before everyone's even gotten a turn. Now, I don't mind a hard co-op if I know that's what I'm in for. But as we talked about in the review, the problem with this game is that it's not marketed that way. A trend we have seen too often and talked about in episode 207 looks like kids games, but they're not. Even the designer, Eric Lang, the designer of Disney Sidekicks, fully admits his game was marketed badly. It's supposed to be a competitor for Disney Villainous, not a kid's game. Well, next we have a comment some of the many local gamers may recognize, Tim Pine, commenting on our Fighting Fantasy Adventures preview to say, I really like this. Love the Choose Your Own Adventures back in the day. Would a single player find it cumbersome to handle four? Hey, Tim, good to hear from you. I don't think it'd be too bad to play this solo. Like it's marketed as a solo or cooperative experience. So obviously um, Martin Wallace and um, 
whatever Wallace Productions, whatever his new company is called. Sorry, Martin. Um, thought this was going to be a solo game, but I just I think you'd miss out on something in the game here, like or arguing over which way to go. Do we go towards the clacking sound or the the bat wings? No, we have to go where it's silent because that's safe. Or the who gets what item? Oh, you found a sword. Well, I want the sword. No, I should have the sword. Plus, there are some puzzles, and it's always nice to have a second set of eyes and another brain for these. But I can totally see it working. It was designed as a solo or cooperative experience, though I think it would be better with more players. What do you think? You played that with them, uh, that one with us with what we played before, right? A full group? Yeah. I, th- I expect it would be faster, if anything. You wouldn't have to yeah. worry about agreements. And an experienced fantasy player is probably going to catch most of the puzzles and solutions. Even backtracking would become easier since you're the only one keeping track of things. True. true. Now, that said, I do think the game is designed to be fun for a group. But if one isn't available, I don't think cumbersome would be an issue. Well, let's wrap up with a surprisingly detailed comment on our Sentinel Comics RPG dice set unboxing. Now, Rich McGee 434 says, The Sentinel Comics RPG has become my favorite Supers RPG by a fairly large margin, but I'm still up for the occasional other rule set as a one-off. Still dust off villains and vigilantes or champions for nostalgia games when old friends are in town, and both uh, M&M and Tiny Supers get some table time once in a blue moon. The rest of the collection mostly collects dust at this point, but mostly it's the Sentinels comics for supers these days. Minor point, it's not actually a full polyhedral set. There's no D20 for anyone who needs one, which you won't if you're using them for the Sentinels, but some people expect a D20 with everything. I suppose it's also mildly inconvenient that the D10s are all one color, making fractionally harder to use as a percentile dice in a pinch, but again, that's something you need for the game they're made for. Probably anyone watching this already has enough oddball D10s and 20s and every other size to choke a horse. (laughs) Well, they do what they're supposed to nicely. With very, very few exceptions, you'll never need more than three of any one die size for a roll during play. And I think all those exceptions are tied to villain abilities. So it's only the GM who might want to tap their dice collection for some spares now and then. Well, thanks for the info, Rich. Now, I'm pretty sure I called out the lack of a D20 in the unboxing. But knowing there are plenty of dice in the set for a player or group sharing is good to know. As for the D100 thing, I wonder how many people playing another RPG would even consider buying something that says Sentinel Dice branded dice. So I guess they were on a sale on Amazon when I was doing the show notes um, for the episode where, or sorry, the, not the show notes, when I was looking for links for the unboxing video. So it's possible they might have been cheaper than a standard set of D&D dice, or sorry, three sets of D&D dice. So maybe you might have bought them thinking you were going to get a full set of polyhedros. What I still love about these um, that they didn't mention here is the fact that the dice are color-coded. And they're not just like any color, though. They match the character sheets. They match the pre-generated characters in the starter set. And they match every example in the rule book, which is just fantastic for anyone new to the game. Now, obviously, um, Rich was not new to Supers RPGs when they played Sentinels, but it's possible it's the first RPG someone might have picked up or the first RPG someone will be playing. Because it's a simple enough system. I could definitely see this being a game you'd introduce kids to. And it is so much better to say, grab the orange die instead of having to say, grab the D8. Now, for us gamers, we instantly recognize the D8, but I have seen, and, and I'm always surprised by it, I show up to a game store for a hobby game night and see people having to stack the dice with the highest number on top because they don't recognize them yet. That removes that. Grab the orange one. That's the D8. Well, that's all the comments we have to highlight this week. Remember, we can't read them all or we would be here all night, but we appreciate each and every comment, email, and piece of feedback we receive. First off, our fifth anniversary giveaway ends tomorrow night at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. So for those of you here live, this is your last chance to enter or grab a couple of bonus entries. You can find the giveaway pinned at tabletopbellhop.com. Next up, as we first announced last week, we won't be recording a live show next week. Yeah, that's right. This 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 past weekend, Deanna and I had some time off, but this upcoming week, the entire family is heading up north uh, to visit my aunt and uncle in Campbellford. And no offense, I'm hoping the podcast is one of the last things on my mind while they're on Wednesday. Things should be back to normal in September, and we should be back to recording live on Wednesday the 6th. Now, finally, one last note about the audio podcast, and something you may have already noticed, but we're adding chapters. 
That's right. Now, if your podcatcher supports them, and not all do, you'll be able to jump between audio sections of the show just like YouTube viewers can for all new episodes. Unfortunately, going back to update old episodes isn't really practical. Yeah, thanks to everyone who spoke up and requested this feature, letting us know it was a priority for you. Now, we do have a small favor to ask for everyone. If you see any problems or issues, please let Sean know. At Sean at TabletopBellhop.com, because we're still working out the many kinks and we're hoping that next week should look even better than this week. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight, the plan is to answer questions from the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch, and we really have no idea where this is going to go. The last time we did this, we spent the entire episode talking about the intersection between video games and board games. Which I invite you to check out that discussion. It was back on episode 210 of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Live board game Q&A. Um, done before I realized we should name our Q&A episodes after the fact, which is what we're going to do tonight. So while we're waiting for some questions from the chat, here's one from our question pile to get things started. All right, this one comes from local game designer, patron of the show, Roger Malott. Roger writes, Hey Mo, I was reminded of one of my favorite movies, Memento, recently. It starts at the ending and works backwards to the beginning, resulting in one of the best aha moments I've seen in film. I was just wondering if anyone has made a game based on this concept. It would start with a situation like a knight fighting a giant raccoon with a sword of fire wearing nothing but his long underwear. <laughs> the player would then construct a backstory to explain exactly how he got into that situation and how these strange items came about. This sounds like an RPG game, which is more in your realm of expertise. A cool name for this game would be Backstory. What are, are your thoughts yet? Has this been done yet? Oh, I was really hoping we were going to get Mr. Jeff Seuss in the chat room tonight for this one to help us out. Because uh, Mr. Seuss is the master of the story game RPG, the, the as I like to call them, uh, indie hippie games. <laughs> to No offense to hippies or indie game designers. It's just, you know what I mean. Um, past the stick role playing. This is definitely his wheelhouse. And I have to say... There's got to be something is, is, is my first thought. Like, like this just sounds like the, the designer of fiasco, like Jason Morningstar came up with this, right? Like that style of game, it, it's got to exist. Now I will say I've never seen Memento. So honestly, I keep meaning to watch it because Roger's question has been sitting in our pile for a while because it wasn't something long enough. I think to dedicate a full episode to, and, but I get the concept. Like I understand. Now, what I'm not sure, and maybe Sean can help this, is how is this different from a flashback episode of a serial, right? Where you've got the Star Trek episode, you turn it on, and the Enterprise is on fire, and you see Uhura gets stabbed, and, like, Scotty falls out an airlock or something. And then it says, you know, 38 days ago, and it jumps back and tells you. Like, how is that different than Memento? All right, well. I've never actually been able to bring myself to watch this movie, but I do understand the concept. I'm just not actually a Christopher Nolan fan. So I would expect to find this sort of game on itch.io as a solo journaling game, honestly. But a quick search yesterday didn't manage to turn one up. But that's not to say there isn't one there already. Um, really, Memento is about um, a character who has lost the ability to create new memories. Um, okay. so when they start off, some time has passed from a certain event, the last event they can remember, and they need to work out what has happened since that event, uh, without being able mm. to remember anything new either. Like that they're, they're, they're goldfish. Um, they cannot create new memories. Um, and that's, that, that's sort of the, the, the concept behind right. it all. And it's a detective story, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that is a little different than the. What Roger described to me reminds me more of the flashback episode, which, which I have to say I hate. I absolutely <laughs> hate TV series with flashback episodes. I hate those. Boom! Three weeks ago. I, yeah, so I, I mean, uh, like to, to play a flashback episode in RPG is pretty simple, right? You start right. off with a conceit, and then you go back to you go back and the get beginning to of the game and play until you get to that point. Right. Whereas which this I've one, seen. you're actually trying to figure out all the bits that happened backwards rather than forwards. Okay. All right. Yeah, because I was going to say, I've definitely seen the flashback done. That Yes, here's your conceit. That's your RPG thing. You sit down with your group and you decide 
we're getting to this point. Everything you do has to work towards that point. Anything else you want to do in the middle goes, right? That's very much a story game right there. And I'm certain there are versions of that. Um, now, I'm going to start with board games since I know I'm calling this an RPG. But I did, I do think some of the time travel ones kind of do this, but specifically Tragedy Looper. Though the very beginning premise doesn't work based on that. So in Tragedy Looper, you set up a board and it's different people are at different locations on the board. And the first round of play, the players basically just interact with what's going on. They just kind of walk around and check out the scene. And then something horrible happens. And then it's trying to go backwards to figure out what caused that horrible thing to happen and stop it. So you end up playing through a second time and then you find out, well, the only reason it happened is because Jimmy was in the school. Now this is an Asian game and Jimmy is definitely not a character name <laughs> in it. It's very much an anime game, I, but I'm just, I haven't played tragedy looper in long enough. So then you're like, okay, Jimmy had to be in the school for him to die. So if we stop Jimmy from going to the school, but it's not that there's more to it. It's more like, why was Jimmy in the school? Cause you won't be able to stop Jimmy going to the school. But if you can find out Jimmy went to the school because he broke up with his girlfriend, and he's depressed. Well, then you can go and you try to stop the breakup. Well, that didn't work. Why did he break up for his girlfriend? So I think you get some of that with Tragedy Loop. Yeah, there's, the there's an aspect of it. But I can I can really think of that gets any of it. And it definitely doesn't have. So Roger's clarifying. But Roger is in the chat tonight. So that's awesome. Um, He's using tattoos and photographs to record his past. I can't think of any game that uses anything like that. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially, you, you'd need to, uh, again, as you're trying, as you figure things out, if you don't record them, you lose them uh, because again, yeah, he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a memory. It's a it's, like it, you said that that sounds like a journaling RPG. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think it, more than again, anything, Hexio, it's got to be there. RPG. Solo Solo Itchio, it's got to be there somewhere. Uh, yeah, someone's done this because I noticed you you did have uh, you did a little research yeah, so and I, I looked at I that did link. Call out, I did call out one. So there's a game called up from James West called The Pool, which is a very narrative, uh, bizarre spend things to do things kind of rpg well someone has done a version called snowball where things are snowballing and i saw that recommended for people who want a momento like experience now i've got to say i am not jeff seuss so reading through the pool of blog posts trying to explain mechanically how this works was um a little tldr for me <laughs> and i'm like all right i'm just gonna throw it out there so if anyone wants to look up the snowball variant of james v west the pool that might give you something what you want. And we'll toss, I'll toss a link to that in the chat room right now. If Roger is more willing to take the time to read through indie game designer speech to, uh, this, this is to very, this is there. very hipster indie game designer speech though. Yes. Reading it was it, painful. It's up there. Yes. Um, um, the other one that came up was in media res, which is a one shot, but it's from an old Cthulhu magazine. For Call of Cthulhu and Cthulhu-like games is an old magazine, old zine that no longer exists called Unspeakable Oath. And issue number 10 in 1993 featured a game called In Media Res, but it does what I was talking about. It does the boom, something happened. Uh, in that case, actually, you're, you're, you are like wake up and you're in an asylum and someone's dead and you don't know if you did it or you didn't. And you need to play back to find out what happened. But again, I don't, it doesn't have that memory aspect. I think it's just, you're basically playing a flashback. Yeah. It's, 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 you're starting in media res and then doing the, how did we get to this point? Fair enough. Yeah. It's definitely an interesting thing. And, and yeah, I, I mean, going out of itch.io, checking out the journaling RPGs, uh, I feel like it really has to be in there somewhere. Uh, that, that feels like the most likely candidate yeah, for like that. I, I'm kind of surprised that that when I did Google this, I didn't find anything blatantly like just seemed like it should be out there. <laughs> like, yeah, no, absolutely. I'm like, I, I say, I, I it, is a, it is a well-loved movie. It's it's again, it's not for me. I'm not a Nolan fan, but there are a lot of Nolan fans out there. Uh, so I was surprised as well. All right. Does that help at all, Ryan? At least I, I gave <laughs> you a link to the if you want to dive into um the Forge style indie RPG development brain. Um, there is a link there for you in the chat room, which I will, of course, throw in the show notes. And again, I'm not I'm not trying to 
like bash on indie game designers. Uh, that That is a, a very interesting brain space. I know a lot of people who write games who came out of the Forge and some fantastic games came out of the Forge, but it kind of breaks my uh, breaks my <laughs> trad gamer brain to go through some of this stuff. Um, Epidia's boxes is another one. I just, I can't, I'm like, maybe if we're sitting at a coffee shop and you showed me with with, with plates and salt shakers, I might get it, but reading the blogs, I'm lost. Fair enough. Well, uh, because this is a Q and A episode, we let our our guests ask us anything. We got a question from the chat yep. from Ryan who asks, "What is your favorite meat and your favorite dish to have it in?" Hmm. I am gonna have to go with uh, pork and or veal. Oh, it's close. <laughs> I, I oh, I can't decide. I can't decide between pork or veal schnitzel because. I'm going to go with pork schnitzel and not just because that's what I had uh, about an hour before <laughs> we went live tonight. Um, one of my absolute favorite dishes of all time is a really good wiener schnitzel, which is a pork schnitzel. Sorry, wiener schnitzel would be veal. Is, is a really good wiener schnitzel, but I haven't had a really good wiener schnitzel since the rat's color closed in Windsor. So the equivalent has been pork schnitzel. And oh my God, the high mat has a fantastic pork schnitzel. Now, I may still prefer Wiener Schnitzel, but it's been so long since I've had it that I don't actually know if I prefer it to the pork because it's just nowhere locally sells it. Um, so between those two, that would probably be my favorite meat. Um, veal, no, I'm going to I'm going to no, I'm going to go back to veal <laughs> just because uh, one of my other favorite dishes is a good uh, veal Parmesan. And even more so, again, hasn't existed in years. Trevi Pizza here in Windsor used to have a lasagna where you get slices of veal schnitzel in, or not veal schnitzel, um, veal parm in the lasagna. Oh, that was amazing. Like, absolutely amazing. Fair enough. Uh, I tend to be a little more uh, purist, I guess, uh, which would be one way to say it. Uh, so I am, uh, you know, I'm going to say beef, and yep. it is uh, prime rib. Uh, I I don't think yes. you can beat a prime rib. Uh, a a well cooked good prime rib is just. I mean, it should melt on your tongue. Uh, just you know, I've and I've had them. Uh, I've I've had some some fantastic you know super expensive steakhouse ones, and I love cooking a prime rib when I can actually afford to cook a prime rib, mm -hmm. which is always the problem, of course. Uh, but yeah, no, it's it's really tough to beat a, a, a nice uh, nice chunk of cow. See, I know Deanna would agree with you. She loves prime rib. I am not a fan. No, I, I if I'm doing beef, I'd rather have a good New York strip. Mm, fair enough. Which is the cheapest. So, <laughs> I don't know. Most flavorful, I find. I don't know. I need it well seasoned, though. There well you go. seasoned. All right. Uh, so, jumping back into the chat again, Darkling Blight asks, with the surprise popularity, and I, I, I kind of question that yeah, one. Yeah, I'm not sure about surprise. Uh, with the surprise popularity of Baldur's Gate 3 um, and, you know, millions of dollars in pre-sales in video games recently, any other role-play settings you would like to see get attention on the video game side? What I would absolutely love to see? Feng Shui. Give me Feng Shui. Give me a who video game. Like, uh, does anyone remember any more one of the early, I think it was um, Bioware, Jade Empire on the Xbox? I adored that RPG. That was a fantastic game. Um, probably has some cultural sensitivity issues. Maybe not. Um, it was a long time ago when I played it. But like, like Feng Shui, if people know it, like the whole Shadow Fist system with the multiple timelines and Feng Shui sites and being able to jump through the different time periods and... Having, um, what do they call them, uh, where you can have the shifts, where time, like you go back in the past and you take over. If, if one faction owns enough Feng Shui sites, it actually changes the future. And in today's reality, the only reason we don't have magic is because the magic clans don't own enough Feng Shui sites in the past anymore because the futurists went to the past and just burned them all, right? Like, I adore that game setting, and I love Who movies. I, I adore all types and one of the things that i loved about that game it was robin laws trying to be able to make one rpg that handled all types of asian cinema so you have the um i don't even know early dynasty movies with the you know the peasant revival with the couple of brave heroes the um seven samurai but also be able to have 
um, Big Trouble in Little China, set in modern time because there happens to be a Feng Shui site in Little China, and that's why magic works, but only there. And also have the weird sci-fi things, and then the weird messed up stuff like eunuch sorcerers and hopping vampires, and have it all work in one game. And I adore Feng Shui. I, I, I is just such an amazing setting. The Shadow Fist, I should be calling it Shadow Fist, because the Shadow Fist setting, I think, would be amazing in a video game. And I think the video game wouldn't be Baldur's Gate. It wouldn't be trying to recreate the mechanics of Feng Shui, but the universe of it. Fair enough. Um, I, I honestly, I can't, uh, my, my brain keeps going the other way, uh, because I keep wondering why has no one done a licensed Diablo RPG? The world there of one. Diablo. Is there it's one? It's done. Is there? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I missed that one then. Yep. Uh, unfortunately it uses a certain D20 system. Uh, of course it does. So it's not a real, uh, yeah. So I don't <laughs> count that then. That doesn't count. Uh, no, Give me a, a real RPG book. game based. I, I don't want a hack and slash. Like, I mean, I realize that oh, that's I, what the game Diablo? Diablo is. How do you not have it? Because Diablo has a really rich world. Like the story going on around your characters who happen to be hacking and slashing through demons is fantastic. There's a lot there to be the people outside of the hero who's going through slashing. Um, yeah, they're, they're darkling light. The floor lore goes deep. I haven't even played D4 yet. Even just Ds one through three, there's a lot there. Um, you know, your, your characters could be hunting to try and find what caused the cow level. Uh, um, the cow level. So, uh, yeah, I so, don't, yeah, I never yeah. dived that much into it. Yeah, no, there, there's a lot there. And, and unfortunately, there's no, I mean, you don't need an RPG to just hack and slash through a bunch of monsters. You know, you don't need. Yeah, to. that's right. That's kind of what I was like. Oh, don't you kind of have that? Yeah, no, I what, would what much I rather be the, the, the merchants and the citizens in the world uh, around Diablo. Uh, so it came out in 2000 and it was Diablo 2 Diablery. And it was D20 based using D&D third edition rules. Oh, wow. Set in the <laughs> sanctuary system. Well, sanctuary is a location. That's where yeah, Diablo yeah. is set. Yeah, yeah. I swear there was another one, but I'm, I'm failing at finding the second one. There was the D and oh, there was also the Dungeons and Dragons adventure game Diablo Two Edition. So that's what it was for. Okay. So it was actually an edition of D and D, and it was a quick start. So kind of like the um, Stranger Things D and D starter right. set. But you would love this. This was for second edition D and D. Oh, so I could play it. <laughs> so you could play it. A D and D second edition Dungeons and Dragons Diablo Two adventure game. Sorry, oh. Dungeons and Dragons adventure game Diablo Two edition. Oh, that might actually be one to go on my shelf if I can find it. Out yeah, of, if I can find that find at a reasonable price. But yeah, and I've seen them at store shelves. And where I saw it, like at Babbage's, right? As well, Diablo, yeah. right? Which goes yeah. back to Babbage's was awesome. Yeah, that's All right. Rough. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw in a different one. Oh, so wait, what are we trying to get? We're trying to get a video game based on popular role playing, playing scenes. As... You would like to see get attention oh, okay. on the video Never game mind. side. No, oh, no, that's the opposite of what I was just thinking of. <laughs> um, next would be Tales from the Loop, but uh, technically, I guess that goes back to Stein and Stallenhog's art. But like, wouldn't yeah, a Tales that from would the be, Loop game not be awesome? I don't know. That'd be interesting. I feel like see a lot I of the games by, I, I leap to. I'm like, oh, this would be. Oh, wait, wouldn't that be more of a digital novel or novel experience than an actual game? Oh um, no, like think think Fallout Four or Three in my brain but set in the sweetest loop and you play a kid Possibly. like, like yeah. let you explore. Hmm? Yeah, no, I can see that. Yeah, that works. That's what yeah. I'm thinking, right? Like that style follow three, whatever you, 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 the game starts, you, you're, you're in class. Yeah. You know, it's a rent, it's a normal day. Something happens. So you here could go gonna, that way or you could go explore. I'm going to go with one of the friends of the friends of the show why don't we get a Hydro Hackers based like cyberpunk game? You know, like they take the cyberpunk engine, but put it into the Hydro Hackers world, fighting for the water, fighting against yeah. the man. I, I, I think because the person who wrote Hydro Hackers would rather they use a system <laughs> other than cyberpunk. No, no, I'm not, not, not as like, I'm, but I'm thinking of like, there is the game cyberpunk, that kind of right. a video game. Oh, like the video game. Yeah, yeah. Cyberpunk. the video game okay. cyberpunk, like a, like a mod for cyberpunk yeah, yeah. for H yeah, two yeah. O. Yeah, yeah, that that style of video game. You've got the cyberpunk uh, twenty forty five video, or is it twenty forty five? 
um, video game know. that came out. 77, isn't it? Uh, I don't Something? know. I never played it. Uh, yeah, but you take, you take that, um, but, you know, just use that sort of style of game. You know, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, detective style game, uh, but you put it into... Mm-hmm you know, the hydro hackers world instead of the cyberpunk world. Oh, I, th- I think, I think Phil's hydro hacker setting is fantastic. I mm-hmm. really do. Absolutely. Unfortunately, it seems Phil has given up on hydro hackers and it's never going to get past Nashcan. So that part kind of sucks. Um, now the other, our other friend of the show that I, I could see, uh, and, and who has branched out into a wide variety would be Tracy and their, um, yeah, Iron Etta. Nor- Iron Etta uh, format. I mean, they have already yeah. gone to a, a number of different places with their setting. Uh, a video game would be another possibility, although I th- mm-hmm. I don't think they have that on their I'd roadmap. Want out of that. I think an Iron Etta, I would want something like Hades. That you're some Norse person who's cursed to keep resurrecting mm-hmm. until something's fixed. And and like the battling the 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 giants everything right oh, yeah. like yeah, you're yeah. bone bonded but you're there's something else special where you can't die and, and it yeah. sucks like you're yeah. not happy about it <laughs> one one of the one of the final levels would be that you know that that bone bound versus uh, right. dwarven versus mecha the dwarven destroyer yeah I could totally see that yeah absolutely role playing settings and, and oh I'm downstairs I can look around <laughs> masters of the universe that's a role playing setting right there. No, yeah, but do Joe, we want video games of that? I don't think we want Gamma video games. World. There's a good one. Gamma World. So I guess no, that's not fall. I, I want Gonzo Gamma World. How is there not a Gamma World RPG? Surely mm-hmm. there's got to be a Gamma World PC game that's not called Gamma World. Some <laughs> old groundyard has been playing Gamma World for years, made a PC game. There, there must be. I would love to see a Gamma World. Um, uh, I still want to see a good superhero game done on a PC. I don't I don't think it can be done. Freedom <laughs> Force was the last one I remember enjoying. Uh what do we got here? Uh there was a game Battle called Tech Gamma World uh, on for the PC. Now uh, I wonder if it's based on Gamma World. In the fall of 2012, scientists at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland embarked on a new series of high energy experiments. Yeah. The big that's, mistake. Yeah, that's Gamma World. Mm-hmm. So it has been done. All right. I need a modern one. And, and for the oh, the you elves. know what? It was an Atari game, but it never actually got released. Oh, there you go. There we go. That's the problem. So it was. It was. So that's why it was announced, but it was can- it was and- announced and then canceled before release. All right. There we go. That's uh, uh, for 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 the elves with cyber deck loving fans. Shadowrun, but that's been done. That's right. There's like yep. five. I kickstarted them, and I haven't played any of them. <laughs> never mind. Never mind. And there is a par- There's even a paranoia one already. Yeah, I played it. I've got it. We reviewed it. We have a review of the yep. Paranoia role-playing game. I, yeah, Darkling Black points out DC Universe Online is still going on somewhere or somehow. Yeah, it's, it, it's, I played it's it for still... a while. It was interesting to start, but again, my big problem is I never end up connecting with groups, and yeah. all of those MMOs stink of as first as, as single mm-hmm. player once you get past your you know the initial startup you know you get through the 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 on rails portion and then if yep. you don't have a team if you don't have a squad it's utterly pointless and that was my problem with dc if i'd had a yep. squad i would probably have still been playing these i i sat down when we first got the xbox um yeah, and, I, and i'm like oh xbox. this is cool and i jumped in and i yep. loved it and then it was like oh well what do i do now oh i wander around and and get people you know thumbing their nose at me so <laughs> I was huge into City of Hero City of Villains until it went down. Well, it's still I want going, like though. a solo the one though. Like, like City of Hero story. City of Villains is still going. Um, Not officially. No, no, it's, it's all used, but forever. the users have completely Yes, the kept users it have up. a version. I tried it. The, unfortunately, the users are keeping it looking and playing like it did oh, yeah. instead of trying to improve it at all. I get it if if you're a fan, sure. Uh there is um, someone working on a a new version with new graphics and new um Okay new stuff i actually backed it on uh, i don't even he wasn't even kickstarter it was somewhere else i backed it right um and i'm trying to remember the name as i scroll rapidly through my windows um uh my windows menu because i don't no, actually i want, I like, I want something like freedom force right like i i want a solo like i, I want a Baldur's gate 3 i want it well i know it's Baldur's gate 3 you can team up with other people i don't want an mmo i want a superhero pc game yep. give me cyberpunk 277 make it superheroes 
That's fair. Heck, it can be very Baldur's Gate 3. Give me a team. Let me play the Freedom Force, right? Give me give me a modern Freedom Force. I'd probably be happy. Yeah, Freedom like, Force is good, Like, if we're saying based on RPGs, like, heck, whatever, Marvel, DC, I don't care. <laughs> Actually, to be fair, I want a Sentinel to the multiverse. Like, uh, sorry, whatever the Sentinels RPG is called. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, we got uh, Tex yeah, asking I, where I'm, we I'm could sure get a mug. Others. Where, where, I, is there where anywhere you, you could mug? get a mug? Well, I can give you a chance at getting a mug at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on the big thing that says win a mug. There we go. Doesn't quite say that, but it's pretty close. I have no idea. No, I'm my... still saying my, my main one, though. Like, if I had to pick one out of all those, still Feng Shui. I would love to see. I, I don't know. I Feng Shui. Though Tales from the Loop's really close. Tales from the Loop done by Bethesda. Like, like Fallout level of quality. Right. But make it in. The, in give me the Swedish one. It doesn't have to be in the States. Just give me the Swedish one. Boom. Dump me in. Give me a huge flipping world. Let me go find a secret passage on the side and go start exploring under the loop. You know, let me find the the cave that suddenly sends me back to prehistoric time. Like, like give me all of it, and not like the super dark, depressing loop from the Amazon series. <laughs> uh, and the, so the, keep the hopeful part of eighties in there. Uh, and yeah, you know, the City hopeful until Titan. we get nuked. Yeah, City of Titans from uh, Missing Worlds Media is the okay. uh, is the one that I. Uh, Hope may actually turn into something someday. Which, which Some, might be City of Heroes. Yeah, may may we someday become a uh, a modern like Unreal Engine uh, capable nice. sort of City of Heroes thing. Uh, with I, real I, I jumped back on it for a bit and I had fun for a while, but yeah, the see, problem is I, all of those so games in the end were just procedurally generated random fights where you team up with. I had a team, and your team would go to that building and open it and go around the corner and then up the stairs, then over here, then over here, then. Yeah, you got the MacGuffin. Then you go do it again and again and again. Well, and see, like, everyone I know, like all the people I know who are still City of Hero fans to this day, are RPG are like our role players. Our role, so playing, they aren't. Yeah. yeah, they aren't just they're doing not the mission. They're role playing because the grind got so boring. Yeah, yeah. No, using it as a place to role play a super's character. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Playing the game anymore now? No, that's that's why that game still exists. Is because all the role players wanted somewhere to role play their characters, and a lot. Of, I see a lot of. Uh, like RPG forums uh, for yep. supers, they are still using City of Hero characters as their like art. It's like I made this character well, yeah, in City yeah. of Heroes the as my, generator was as, as my uh, you know costume uh, etc. All right, um, All right. moving on. Let's from get another one. RPG questions here. We have another question from Roger Dodger Games. Do you play a lot of games with five or more players? How do they go? I. <laughs> it depends on the game. Um, I, I, there are certain games that work with groups that big. Um, we play quite a bit five. If Tori and Kat are over and Sean's over, Sean's played a lot of five player games with us. I th there's just some, especially Euro games to go back to our older discussion on how I probably shouldn't use that term anymore. Some cube pusher economic uh, engine builder, those style of games get to be too much with five but others sing at five like scythe i will happily play at five terraforming mars i'd prefer to stick with four um i don't i don't and then party games is totally different five to me is like the sweet spot for most party games like your minimum amount once you have five players now i'm willing to like let's break out the telestrations um thrones of valeria great with five Though it's it's each play your own, it's better with six or four because you can play into teams, but it worked great at five. Mm -hmm. Um again, I'm looking around the room <laughs> for those who aren't watching the video. I'm not remembering player counts. I I don't know. I like five to me is fine. Three to me is fine. Um more than five is where it gets a little rough. Um usually once I get up to six players, depending on what we're doing. Like if it's game night and we're all together to play together, I'll play six players. But usually once we get to six, like on a New Year's night, there's six of us. We'll split into two groups of three. Yeah, we did Castle Panic with five a couple weeks back. Yeah. Um, I think Castle Panic's fine with five. Actually, I didn't like it with six. I found, I found six was too much. Yeah, well, and but again, as, as you of, said, when you hit six, it's a great way to start teaming up. You know, that's yeah. that's the once time I'm you drop six, back I down to, to two, uh, two sets of, of three rather than uh, keep counting up. Uh, again, Telestrations behind you right now is one of those yep. exceptions where it can play the big numbers. Uh, I know you were a little concerned. You want at least five. 
four. It's just it's too quick. Yeah. You only get two drawings, right? It's like, oh yay, it made it around. You need at least five for telestrations. Uh Monstrosity, what's that? Uh, that because I know that gets a little long when you get too many players in there. It what happens with the monstrosity is technically you're supposed to play so everyone's the investigator twice. When yeah, you have too many people, time. that just okay. That's a lot. Because <laughs> every round is a minimum of two minutes twenty seconds. Minimum. Because that's the timed portion of the game. But in between is all the voting and talking and what do you think of this, right? That makes every round probably about five minutes each. And five minutes per player seems good, but when you're playing a rapid fire party game, once you got around the table once with eight players, you're looking at we've spent an hour, right? And then you're like, well, I know it's only forty minutes, but you know, between whatever, people getting up, grabbing a drink or anything. And you're like, oh, do I really want to spend another hour just drawing silly monsters? Yeah. Um, like the colonists or not the colon caverna. That I won't play at high player counts. So it's a great game. It supports, I think, seven or something ridiculous like that, but it's just too long. Um the big four X games, I think, are best at five or six, like Eclipse, Twilight Imperium, but you know what you're in for, right? Like, you know, you're down for an <laughs> epic game night. You you don't want a quick game night. You want that to feel epic. You want it to drag out. You want to be playing for a long time. Those are games I love playing at high player counts. Fair enough. So, yeah, I don't know. To, to me, it's, it's the one thing I like, I, I wish manufacturers won't do this because they think it'll limit sales or publishers won't do this, but like the board game geek recommended that tends to be pretty accurate as long as the game has enough votes. Cause most gamers are pretty good at judging. This was fun at five or it was too long. Um, and it just depends on the game. Some games are designed to play at six, um, Battlestar Galactica. You want to play it at five. Once you play at six, it adds in a weird funky rule about Cylons. Five is the perfect amount. I won't play that game at any count other than five. I'll only play Battlestar Galactica with five people at my table. Uh, Roger um, mentions the alpha is good at six. Yeah, the alpha was pretty good for, for higher player counts. Um, almost every game with a GM plays best at five. So like Star Wars Imperial Assault, I think is best at five. One player playing the Empire, four players playing the Hero. Descent, Journeys in the Dark was the same thing. Um, uh, what's the, even the, the the American Haunted Heartland game? What is the name of that stupid game? Not It's not stupid, sorry. Oh, uh, Ghost Betwixt. Mm. You want it. Four players and a DM. The classic Hero Quest. Five player game right there. One player plays, uh, I'm going to say Zardoz. That's not the right name, I know. And Zardoz and everyone else plays Heroes. I, I, like I said, it, it depends on how the game's designed. If it's designed for five players, great. Now, if it's designed for four and they made it available to play for five, I think that's where it can be hard and, and sometimes go too long. Like to, to me, Terraforming Mars is one of the examples that once you get to five, I don't know what it is. Like you think adding one more player would add 45 minutes for some reason with terraforming Mars, it adds an hour and a half. I don't know why in that particular game, um, dominant species, if I remember is best at five. I, I like high player count games for games that support high player counts, I guess. Fair enough. I will say the sweet spot in general for most games seems to be three. Whereas I usually play four. most, most gaming I do is four player, uh, you know, me D and the kids or me D cat and Tori. Um, so playing just me, Sean and D we've hammered through some games that seem like they should be longer and they're not with only three. So, um, but that's also, I, that's I also a level of, of the experience and, and willingness to, to sort of, you know, head down and head down and game with, you know, sipping coffee and, yeah. and playing through where it's it, not necessarily the most social and relaxing gaming that we've done at the, you know, when, when the three of us sit down and, and we've got some games to get done. Uh, Hughes and Q's, you want at least five, if not more. That game's better with 10 players. Not many games play 10 players. <laughs> Trick draw, more with five, whatever the max is. Uh, five might be the max. I should have brought that one tonight, um, today, earlier today. Diamonds is is one of the best um, trick-taking games that plays at five. That's actually why I love Diamonds when it came out. Like I like Heart Spades. Diamonds is weird because when you play offsuit, something funky happens, which involves these diamonds, which are actually how you win the game. But what I love about it is you can play five. I'm not at that time. I don't even know what there was. There, there must have been. I think Wizard might have played five or six, but like there weren't really hobby trick takers that played high player counts. But generally, I, I'll still say it though. Like if I get to six players, unless the goal is for those six people to hang out all night, like if it's 
public play event and we get two table if we get six people showing up, I'm generally gonna say, Hey, why don't we split into two tables of three unless I can't teach both tables? Um Psycho Babble uh plays good with five. I found once you got past six, though it just becomes too easy for one roll. Though uh I'll talk about that later. I guess that becomes more difficult when alcoholic beverages are involved. <laughs> Yeah, no, Ryan's uh, right there. Co op, uh, co op games when you you get too high. Uh, one of the yep. big problems with most co op games I find is you know in order to enable the co op uh, at larger player counts, it's you know the the bad guys act every time any player acts. Uh, so mm -hmm. in some cases, by the time you get around to you, the evil, bad, you know, negative opposite you know, play game side of the game has done so much that. You're already feeling watered down, <laughs> like uh, under the yeah. under the th thumb before it even gets to be your turn. Uh, and so, realistically, you know, three or four can really be a sweet spot for a lot of those co-ops. Yeah, and then same with the um, even when you're not facing an adversary, the more players you have, the more quarterbacking is probably going to happen for someone. And it can, obviously, once you get up to five players, there's probably at least one player who didn't make a decision that entire game, <laughs> if not two or three. Plus, the higher chance you're going to get people butting heads, too. All right. Yeah, sweet spot. Um, the other one, like code names, all the code name games. Like Duet plays great with two, but I think it plays even better with four or five. Or I, What I like about code names with, with five is you actually have three players on one side and, and two on the other. Duet. But it's cooperative, so who cares? Right. right. It doesn't matter that your teams are unbalanced, which I actually like. Fair enough. Well, we got a follow-up question from Roger here. That isn't a follow-up, but I think it kind of melds in nicely with what we've just been okay. talking about here. Uh, and this came in from Discord earlier today, where he says, I like a lot of player inter interaction and negotiation in games, mm -hmm. but some players don't enjoy any interaction. Yep. They enjoy solving a challenging puzzle more than trying to peer inside their opponent's heads. Uh, yep. How do you deal with diverse needs in a game group? I think that's true of any, whether it's um, negotiation, interaction, social deduction, dexterity, real time or not. Um, uh, you split people up like I, no one game is going to make everyone happy. And if your goal is to keep everyone interested and happy, the only thing you can really do at that point is compromise. Is you play the puzzle game first and then you play the social deduction game next. Or you play the the negotiation game. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a big enough game collection, you might be able to find games that cater to both groups. But I tend to find that when you try to do that, neither group ends up happy. Like they're like, oh, I like this part, but I didn't like this part. And it, they're better off just playing a game they fully like instead of one where they like part of. So that that's one of the things I've learned over the years running public play events, that if someone's you know, you're like, oh, I like, I, I love worker placement games and figuring out a puzzle. And there's another group that likes, I love trying to to play a hidden role and find a trader. Well, you mash those two together and you end up with Shadow Hunters, which was actually played at the barbershop bar. Doak was so happy. He finally got to play a full seven player game of Shadow Hunters. But for the players who like worker placement, they're like, oh, I didn't like all the, the, the lying and trying to just figure things out. And other players are like, well, I knew the answer. But I couldn't collect the stuff to be able to give my answer, and I didn't like that. And I'm like, and I think you end up with both groups not happy. Now, the people who like social deduction and worker placement are like, this is awesome. They got a social deduction worker placement game. So I get it, but, like, you can't make everyone happy. And I one of the, it goes to the stuff we've talked about before many, many times on the show about a session zero is if you're putting together a game group, right? Like, you're, you're, you've decided you're going to get together on Wednesday nights at easy mode, which easy mode is long gone. Rest in peace, easy mode. And you're trying to make everyone happy. Well, the best thing you can do at that point is find out what people want to play the next week and let them know, like, hey, I'm going to be bringing this. If you're not interested in that kind of game, you might want to bring your own game to play or not show up this week. Um, stuff like that. Like, you set expectations at the beginning of the night. And when you're looking at an event like that, your best thing you can do is let people know ahead of time what you're going to bring. And let people know, like, like hey, if this game's not for you, like, uh, people... You don't all have to play the same game together if you happen to be at the same event, right? Like, split up. Go play two-player games. I, I am really tempted to run a night at the barbershop bar where everyone just plays two-player games. The problem is I can't clone myself to teach that many two-player games at once. <laughs> but I kind of want to do, like, a two-player-only game night where everyone just plays two-player games. There are some fantastic two-player games. I brought a whole ton of them home from Origins 
that I never get to play and people don't get to play because they all want to play in the big six, seven, eight. Well, we've got 11 of us. And I'm like, well, I have psycho babble, but, um, and I, I've, I don't even think I've got telestration 12 players and, um, I'll teach you to play uh 31 with the deck of cards, but there's not much else I can give you at that player count code names. I can break that out, but like, we're not going to sit down and, and build cities and manage our grain and resources with 11 players. It just, it doesn't exist. But at the same time, I think there's a, a, a real um, want to, when you're out at a social night, like the bar, like the barbershop bar really is, uh, it's a fantastic show, social event besides the gaming yeah. aspect um, to not, you know, isolate and, 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 you know, lock down. We, we've done that, yeah. but there's been a lot of lockdowns. Now, if you can get 11 people together in a group and, and do something together, that's an awesome opportunity uh, and yeah. so I do see where the the love and the the want to play with those larger groups at an event specifically like that one comes from. And then I'm like, you know, come out to trivia night. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I like there's certain types of games that work for that, and there's certain times types of games that don't. Right? Like, I don't know if if you're like, well, we we were gonna have to play exploding kittens or 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 cards against humanity because it's all that'll play this account, and half the people are gonna like it. And and the rest are just kind of I'm like break up like I I get it, but you know what? Two groups of six are gonna have more fun than your group of twelve. And no, you're not all playing together. But you know what? Next round, swap up six uh, three people from each table. Swap to the other table. Like there's ways to do it, and I think that's the key. Um, but it's set expectation, right? Talk to people. Um, but try try to compromise in some way. Like I said, the the big one for most groups when I'm running things is we're gonna play this. And then we're going to play this and realize, like, talk about it. Be like, I know you don't love this kind of game, but they love it. So we're going to sit down and play this for their sake. And then maybe you'll find something you love in this game you missed before. And then we're going to play your game next. And we're going to have these and they're going to check it out and see if they 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 enjoy it more than they thought they would. And that way, both pe- both groups end up getting to play the games they enjoy. And like I said, trying to find that game that fits both groups doesn't always work as well as it. It sounds great in theory, but it, I find it doesn't always work all that well. If you can manage it, two separate game nights. Separate your two, separate yeah. your groups and have more game nights. That's <laughs> it's not a it, an invalid like yes, as adults it seems like we never have enough time to do stuff like that. But that that's the suggestion I always tend to give to RPG groups, right? When they're like, Well, I have one group that really wants to play Pathfinder, or another group that wants to play this. So on one week we play this, and on another week we play this, and I'm like, Oh, you'd just be so much better to just split those players up. And on one week, get together with this group. And on that week, get together with that group. And like, but then I don't get the game every week. But I'm like, but you're not having fun every other week. So why not let the group that's having fun have more fun? And then when you do show up every other week, you get to have more fun. But people are people want to hang out with their friends. So yeah, that, gaming with friends can be complicated. Yep. To not hurt people's feelings and everything. But it, it comes down to the same thing we always talk, say. Talk about it. Right? It's it's Sometimes it's an awkward, difficult conversation. And realize that someone's like, you know, I think you'll have more fun if you don't show up every week. Doesn't that necessarily mean I don't like you. <laughs> don't come out every. I don't want to see you every week. No, you're trying to maximize the fun of everyone playing. Absolutely. All right. Uh, any other questions from the chat before we uh, wrap up what we've got going on tonight in the ask? Last opportunity before we dip into. There you the... go. Red Meeple Ryan is recommending Mega Civ if you need 11 players. Who want that empire building resource management game uh charles finished the game i think it was yesterday or it was telling me about it there are people into those games not for me i know i haven't played it yet i should give it a <laughs> shot maybe i'll love it um i still need to sit down and play my first 18xx with someone who can explain it to me <laughs> instead of trying to read it from the books too i think i'll like the 18xx i'm not sure if i'd like mega Civ. There, there are some locals that just adore those kind of games. Like, like they get together, they make a night of it, they order pizza, they they rate beers, and they play these massive civilization games. <laughs> Whereas we we tend to go for uh, quantity over. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> uh, there aren't too, many, you, aren't too uh, many times at least we play. one of them would probably pay me to review one of those games and talk about it. <laughs> yeah, there are too many times uh, when we sit down and only play one one game in a night or, or, or a weekend, like other than, uh, um, horizon zero dawn, like with, and even that weekend, we still played other games. Yeah. Uh, we still played we just played stuff. a lot of horizon zero dawn as well. We need to do that again. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> although I like the game, I like the game well enough. 
Yeah, it was just unfortunate that we, that we discovered some uh, some problems if you didn't have some all, all of the content, you know, sort of thing. Oh, it's not even that. We, I, I've now talked to the designer. That card's completely useless. Oh, it really? Oh, it doesn't get it doesn't nothing actually become useful later. Oh, god, none, nothing in any of the expansions yet. It's a mistake. It it came from when they were going to do something and they didn't do a thing. Right, and left cards card left over. Unfortunate. <clears throat> The dice were different. There, there were crit symbols on all of them at one time. Ah, uh, fair. They changed the dice, but never went back to remove the symbols from certain cards. Fair enough. Um, yeah, that, I don't remember when that came up. I was doing, I was doing some looking up something about the game. Do we want to hand in uh, nail that one last question, or should we just move on to our copy? I feel like we're a little short tonight, but that's fine. We can go. We I got, got a lot going on. Yeah, we got a lot about. going on after. So yeah, we we got lots of gameplays to talk about. So this? no other questions, which is cool. Well, that's it for tonight's live Q and A. Thank you, everyone, for all the great great questions. Yeah, it's always fun doing one of these. It's kind of relaxing, at least for this part of the show. The after work sucked, but you know what? This part's enjoyable. Thank you, everyone who sent in questions. I greatly appreciated as usual. Um, I'm going to call it one thing I missed. Actually, Red Maple Ryan pointed out there is now a journaling version of Star Trek Adventures, which I just think is cool. So Star Trek Adventures from Modifius, I think it is. The big Star Trek role-playing game that's out now now has a play, way to play solo. And um, Lord of the Rings did that as well. Sorry, The One Ring. Did that as well. Free League put out, um, I, I, I want to call it the Aragorn play, but the Rangers mode or something like that. A way to play that solo. So that was cool. Um, sorry if uh, we didn't interact with everything that was said in the chat, but I do thank you for the questions. Uh, speaking of questions, if you have a question for us, you can hit us up with an email, questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or head over to the blog and click on Ask the Bellhop. And now, in the Bellhop's Tabletop, we look back at the games we played since last episode. Okay, so I've got lots to talk about this week. I um, hosted a public play game night at the Barbershop Bar. D and I were out of town for a couple days, which always leads to some two-player gaming. And we had some guests down from Ottawa today and did some gaming with them this afternoon. So we've got quite a bit, of, or at least I've got quite a bit <laughs> to cover. Uh, I didn't get much gaming in there. I am sorry to have missed Dyson, but then I don't really know Dyson. That's uh, you know, a friend of yours, and, and you're the one who yeah. who enjoys uh, their streams on a regular basis. I think I have caught a one here or there when you've told me to go check out the music that he's listening to right then. Yes. <laughs> but uh, but that's about it. Uh, mostly, I'm sad to have missed the barbershop. Again, I... I uh, they, they, they seem to be picking the uh, the wrong weekends for me time and time again. Uh, and I just haven't been able to uh, get me and or the kids down with them. I one day it will happen, maybe uh, maybe sometime over the Christmas break or something. We can uh, squeak in a uh, a barber shop and September, kids. September sixteenth is the tentative date for the next one. Um, that might I don't even know. Um, it it isn't every other week. Like oh, sixteenth will work actually. That so, is the so whole. That's the, that's that's the whole the schedule. Date. Um, Ian asked while we were out of town and I'm like, I don't have my date book or anything. So I need to look and see what else is going on. So that one, that one, so the that will be the first to work for me in a while. Cause I think I've missed a couple. So there of you go. All right. Uh, I do um, hear we were featured on the screens at the barbershop yes. bar. <laughs> Though it didn't work that well. So, so I guess last time we did it, Sean had put us up on the screens, but then it just like went to the playlist and was playing the dice tower and whatever. Mm. So I'm like, cool enough, right? Put up board game content. So we just put us up. So we had tabletop bellhop content out there, but for whatever reason, whenever one video ended, it didn't go to the next one. Oh, so like it, it was a cool idea. And to be fair, Sean doesn't actually watch our stuff. He's not really <laughs> much of a gamer. And um, I'm talking about Sean, who Sean Garrity Davis. This is a whole um, different Sean. There's a lot of them. Whole different Sean. <laughs> Another. I told you. Before, I've told many people before. I collect Sean's. Um, the cook at the barbershop bar. Um, one of the employees there. And uh, so he was like putting on like the escape box stuff and reviews where I would have put on full episodes. Like I just would have went to our podcast playlist and told it to go possibly to shuffle, but <laughs> I wasn't the one running it. So Fair enough. But it was kind of cool to have us up. A couple of people were like, I don't wait, think you can you. actually shuffle YouTube. Man. No, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, it was kind of, it was kind of interesting, but then people asked for music to be put on. So. <laughs> 
I, it was neat to have up for a minute, but like, I just, we don't have the best kind of leave it on in the background content, I guess. <laughs> yes. We go, ever yes. referred to. Uh, it's a, see, time. I would have, I thought they would have had them up on the TVs, but actually had music playing. I didn't think they would have our content playing audio. That's kind of weird. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the other thing is we don't have closed captioning on everything. Mm, true. So if we had closed captioning or anything, I think they would have left it up. I don't know. Maybe, maybe next time we'll try to figure out something a little better. <laughs> um, before that, though, um, we did play two games of Castle Panic over at Brenda's and finally got to the end of the rainbow. We we have now tried all of the content in the big box behind me here um, and got to try the Crowns and Quest expansion, which I think is... Um, it's it's newer, right? Like this is this is the new hotness for for Castle Panic. So it yeah, has Castle not Panic, been Castle Panic Big Box came out. Castle uh, Crowns and Quests came out after the Big Box, which yes. gener- which is the reason why there is a Big Box second edition essentially because it, the the first Big Box didn't actually have all the expansions in it anymore. Yes. So this is uh, well, well, Crowns and Quests came out, and then Castle Panic second edition came out. Which revised all the artwork and made it look a little nicer. They fixed a couple little things. And then they put out the new second edition big box that now included crowns and quests. And to be fair, this is what Fireside really wanted us to cover was the crowns and quests expansion. So the first thing I'm going to note is we played two games of crowns and quests and that was on the same night. Which is uh, notable because we don't generally play more than one game of Castle Panic in a night. Yes. (laughs) Because it's a two and a half hour flipping game when you add in all the expansions. So not this one. So what this game did, uh, this expansion does, is it is strongly recommended to only play with the base rules. Now, I do have a correction from last week. I was talking about how I had kind of peeked ahead and looked through the rule book, And I said it was designed specifically for the base game and no expansions. Well, actually reading the rules before play, the actual suggestion is designed for the base game and at most one expansion. Do not mix with multiple expansion. It it literally says the game will be completely unbalanced, potentially impossible to win or too easy to win if you use multiple expansions, but there's no reason not to combine it with one. So for Wizard Tower fans, which seems to be the the biggest, most popular expansion, um, you get to keep that in if you want. Yeah, and that makes sense. The Wizard's Tower, I think, is a really fun expansion. Adding that second deck, the option for the other kind of cards, really made it uh a more fun and and variety and and various games so i think the biggest thing i found missing though was the variety in the monsters like the base game of castle panic has goblins orcs and trolls and that's it it doesn't seem like that's it when you played it but like that's not very varied compared to once you throw in the wizard's tower you get the the mega boss monsters the new boss monsters the imps and then like all kinds of different flying creatures and all this other stuff So I I was actually more sad that what we were pulling out of the bag wasn't as interesting as I was not having wizard spells. But I would strongly recommend them. Now, these two plays were with just the base game. Now, what this does is it completely changes the point of the game. So instead of destroying every monster in the bag, you now have to complete two quests. To get these two quests, you're randomly going to determine them. One is what they call the, like, your in-game quest and the other one is called the final quest interestingly you draw them both at the start of the game so you get to see both of them personally i would have liked it if the final quest you didn't draw until it came up but um it does let you plan ahead so while working on the first quest if you know what the final quest is you can do some stuff um would it be and then what i or is it potentially impossible to complete the final quest if you didn't know in advance like is it could you possibly no. go down the wrong path and no okay not nothing. Well, not in the ones we saw. Not at all. Uh, to be fair, the first quest just kind of felt like play a game of Castle Panic. And then here's your starting state for the real game of Castle Panic. Right. If that makes sense. Okay. Um, one of the nice things this dud had is uh, asymmetry. Thank you. Love asymmetry. There are now 12 characters. How many towers are there? Six towers. Two characters per tower. So, yeah, 12 characters. You shuffle up, give two to each player. They get to pick them. These give huge abilities, honestly, huge abilities. Um, They say, feel free to use these in any game. 
But if you do use one of the more panic rules, which are the rules to make the game more difficult, because they won't make it easy. But I got to say, if you're ever playing this game with littler kids, give them heroes to play, because that's going to remove the difficulty that can happen due to randomness and castle panic. Like these abilities are huge. Like, like the archer can change the range band of something. There's a guy that can do one damage, anything, anywhere, not in the forest once per turn. And like, that doesn't sound like much, but if you play castle panic, you know how much that one damage can make a difference. Oh, yeah, that's and it happens every time on their turn. There's someone else that can change color, like, like shift by one arc, right? Like they're all big abilities. Um, another one that draws an extra card. So they just have an extra card in their hand again in castle panic. It doesn't sound like much, but it's huge. Yep. Uh, so I did like that. The final quest I loved because there is a bit of flavor text. Now this is uh, their quests and heroes and all. It's not an RPG. You're not getting that aspect. Um, though the kids got into character because everyone had a quote and the characters, because of those quotes, the characters had some, the, my kids had something to latch onto like, Oh, it says blah, blah, blah. So he's obviously gung ho. So I'm going to do this and this. So there was a bit of that, but it's not an RPG, but I'd like the fact that the final quests ended the siege. So it was the story of how you found out where the monsters were coming from and then what you did to stop them from coming. And I thought that was just neat. Like I just story wine wise, I thought that was neat. So the first quest we faced, I thought it was it was it was fascinating. So you're playing Castle Panic, just the base Castle Panic. You only got orcs, goblins, and trolls. But there were every turn a monolith thing shows up. It was called the Chaos Stone or something. On his own in the map. It has two health. Anytime, and it starts in the archer ring. Anytime a monster spawns in that arc, it shows up on the stone. You go around, you play the full round. At the end of the next player's turn, another monolith shows up. You roll a die. If you roll the same arc, it comes closer. If you roll a different arc, there's now two monoliths. And again, anything that spawns in the arcs with the monoliths instead spawn on them. And there's this like really cool graphic of these goblins jumping out of the stones. And these are the chaos portals that are moving closer to your castle. So we had it so one of them, because of bad die rolls, ended up right outside our castle gates and suddenly a troll pops up. Instead of starting out in the forest, it literally started next to our walls. That was really neat. Um, it, I, I really enjoyed playing through the stone thing. It was like just different type of strategy than you need normally. The finishing for that one was once we got rid of the stones, and that was our goal. We just had to destroy all six stones. Once we destroyed all six stones, we completed that quest. We got to be, rebuild two walls. When you complete a quest, you get some kind of thing. And then we start the final quest. Well, the final quest was the monsters are coming out of nearby caves. You've located the three caves. You have to close them. Well, to close each cave, you had to deal three of one type of card, two of another type of card, and one of the third type of card. And it was um, based on colors. So, like, to close one cave, you need three reds, two blue, and a green card. And then the other caves would be whatever, two, three green, and whatever. Whatever it was. And until you close them, you were drawing four monsters per turn, which is huge. Normally, it's two monsters per turn. You were drawing four. So it was all about getting the caves closed. But the whole thing was you had to now dedicate your hit cards to closing caves, and you weren't killing what was on the map. So that was the first time we played. Second time, I, I don't remember the name of the quest. In the starting setup, normally you have uh, a troll, two orcs, and three goblins. Nope. Six trolls. That's it. Six trolls marching in on your castle. Don't draw any more monsters. Defeat the six trolls to get through the first quest. How was that hard? But we did it. But then we got to the end and we had walls down and a tower down and we were pretty beat up. Then we draw the final quest. Again, we knew this ahead of time. Now you're building outposts. And this was neat. You had to pay a stone and a mortar and a hit card of the appropriate color to build an outpost. And it had this little outpost symbol that literally went around the, the number. So it kind of rings the number for that zone. Any monsters that spawn in the forest with an outpost take one damage when they spawn. Instantly killed goblins. Orcs were down to one. Trolls were down to two. The goal was to build six outposts, one on each of the spots, which meant a brick and a mortar and a color. And there's not enough brick and mortar without cycling through the deck, I think, three times before you could possibly do it. So it gave us this huge reason to hoard brick and mortar. But again, the monsters keep coming. So you're like, do I save my brick and mortar, but now I can't defeat the monsters? So that's just two quests and two final quests that we tried. But like, how different is that? It's almost like every quest is a standalone expansion for Castle Panic that could have been sold separately, but it's thrown in this expansion. That's impressive. It's, it's, they've, they've certainly um, made a giant step away. So, I mean, they, they, the previous to this, you know, they had been this, this 
tacking more and more and more Mm -hmm. into Castle Panic. They had been, you know, slapping clay onto a a statue to just make something bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, And it seems like they finally realized that they may have gone too far, carved Mm -hmm. it back to the original and strategically added aspects to the game rather than just, you know, throwing stuff at a wall. No, I agree completely. And there was a ton of bits like that. That is the one thing with this expansion is just a ton of weird counters and stuff because there's so many different quests and combos. I think there's a total of 18. I think there's 11 quests and seven um, final quests. I might, uh, don't quote me on this. This isn't our full review. So I, I, I might be off on that. Like the, and, and it's like one use the chaos stones, another one use the outpost, another one. There, there's like a, a dude running with a flag. I have no idea what that's for. There's scrolls, there's different portals. Like there's just all these different counters. So when you get the quest at the top, it just says set up. It's like grab this from the box and then put these here and there. And so like it's neat. And I think this is going to add way more variety and honestly replayability to the game than at any of the previous expansions because you never know what you're going to face. Fair enough. Well, that's a, certainly a welcome and interesting uh, thing, although it's kind of a shame that you've got all this other stuff in the uh, in the box well, yeah, that you may great, not but... actually end up wanting to use anymore. Like, I, there's no way before we do a final review with this, this may also be reviewed on the 6th. We'll see. Did I want to now try, okay, let's try uh, Quests and Crowns with uh, Engines of War. Okay, let's try cast Quests and Crowns. I don't think I'm going to go through all that. Um, I, I just don't play Castle Panic enough to get through it all, but it's impressive. Like, I it, honestly, I think Castle Panic could be a lifestyle game. Like, like I know most people listen to this podcast are board game collectors, and they're, 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 their collections aren't just 10 games or just two or just one. But, like, for a family, if you, you could just stick with Castle Panic, buy that box. I, it's not cheap. It's like 120 U.S. But buy that box. You're, you're set for years. <laughs> like, you can just keep trying different combos and trying different things. And let's try this with heroes. And that's like all we play. We've been playing is the basic rules. Every single adventure has rules for less panic or sorry. Every single uh, expansion has rules for less panic and more panic. And we could still be doing all that. And then there's a whole mode where someone plays the monsters and they get a hand of monsters to play. And they can either play two randomly, or they can put one out where they want so they can actually time it. So like the trolls hit your weakest spot and stuff like I haven't even explored that part of castle panic. So if you have been growing up with castle panic, you did your parents buy castle panic as the only game when you were born and you have slowly been growing up with the experience <laughs> of castle panic for your entire life. Let us know in the comments below. Yeah. I like this one. I, this expansion was good. It, it got brought. It, it's what I, I was worried it wasn't going to do. It did what I thought the last expansion might do and brought back the, the kind of silliness. Right. The quick play, the stress, but then some elements that really change up the game. Like I said, the, the stress of those stones, we got to get the stones. The stones are going. What if a troll spawns right there? And and it still took about an hour to play. It got back to that quick play, exciting, stressful, somewhat random. Well, still pretty dang random, but it never felt unwinnable like we had with the base game. So I, I have a feeling these quest and crown scenarios are better balanced than beat every manga m- monster in the bag. Yeah, and the 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 whole idea of not having to beat every monster in the bag is a big deal. Uh, yeah. You know, I remember, you know, dipping your hand into the bag and just sort of dreading the feeling of how, of many, how many monsters were left in there still. Yeah. Um, and, and so to know that you don't have to get through every single one in there yeah. it's a, it's a lot, big relief. <laughs> and on, in the games we played, there were always monsters left in the bag. So we actually finished every game with quests and crowns or crowns and quests uh, before we would have finished a game of the base game. So to me, that's a good thing, really, like getting back to that speedy play. That's that's what was lost with all the expansion. It made it start feeling more like a euro. But do I want Castle Panic to feel like a euro? And I think this won me over back to the no, I want Castle Panic to be a beer and pretzel laugh out loud we go, oh my god, look, there's a goblin right there. No, you have to use that card. We gotta kill the goblin. If we don't do that, he's gonna smash our wall. And oh, never mind. Here comes a giant boulder. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, next up, barbershop bar night. Um, pretty busy overall, over 30 people. Um, what I would say is out of those 30 people, 10 were new, like one third of the people mm. were brand new. Um, some of the people um were who were new last week. We're now seem to be regulars. Like they've now shown up. There's 
There's a couple of people um, that I've now seen at every event this year, which is kind of cool. And while there was the usual group of people we tend to see every month, uh, a lot of regulars were not there. So like Jeff and Cedar LaSeuse totally, once Jeff found out they serve good mixed drinks and not beer, he's been itching to go back. Um, Sean Hamilton was supposed to be out, not Sean from Hamilton, um, but couldn't make it out. Like just there, there was a bunch of people we thought were going to be there who weren't. And I think if everyone had showed up, we might actually hit 50. So in a way, it's I don't think it was good that we were missing those people. But I think once we get to 50, we're going to have a hard time finding a table in a game for everyone. Fair enough. So I was really happy with the number of people who showed up. Um, one of the things we hadn't seen before is an RPG table, which is pretty cool. So there was a Dungeons and Dragons table. Uh, someone was running a one shot, went all night, um, seemed to go really well. Like they they seemed happy in their corner playing D&D. We had a whole bunch of people that, that were like, were like, oh, you guys play D&D here? We're like, if a DM shows up, yes. We don't have organized D&D, but watch the Discord, watch to various places. Um, there's a Windsor D&D server is probably the best place. I'll try to remember to throw that in the show notes. I'll link to the Windsor D&D Discord to find out if future D&D nights will be there. Um, this wasn't something that like we prearranged. It was just, they're like, hey, can I run D&D? Sure, go. Like, um, so that went really well. A uh, huge variety of board games played. Um, I'm not even come close to talk about everything that got played. Um, no young kids this time, which honestly, I, I appreciate that. Like, yes, I want it to be a family friendly open game night, but it is a bar and there are people drinking. And it's definitely like I still made sure I had copies of stuff like drop it and whatever. But it's definitely easier to run a game night when there aren't kids. Yeah, well, I did enjoy the families taking part. Uh, it was great to have them out there and have that experience uh, for everyone. There is something to be said about having a slightly older crowd, when, especially when you're at a bar. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, you're actually, you mentioned the D&D, and I'm like, oh, am I going to have to one of these days promise a masks game at uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> at a barber shop? I, I, there may be, that, that may have to happen sometime. I may have to build a one shot. I'd play. So I'd probably, I probably wouldn't actually. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> you I, you I, got way too much going on in those I nights. I want to play, but I'd be too busy. Though I, you never know. So that that was one of the things that was a little different this week. Is everyone kind of did their own thing. Like they showed up with their own games and wanted to play their own games. And they gathered their own groups of people to do their own thing. So I did teach a few games, but I got to play way more than I usually do, which was kind of nice for a change. There were actually points that like Gwen, was, Gwen and I are like, uh, I, no one needs any help. Why don't we sit here over here and play some Star Realms, right? And then there was a point where where I like Ian was was just kind of standing around, and we're like, everyone looks happy; they're doing their own thing. Um, there was the, the the there was a group that sat there the entire night, and all they played was the um, the new Sentinels, the the um, is it the Mutants and Masterminds version of Sentinels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the M M&M and M version, which I, I can't remember the name of off the <laughs> top of my head. Um, so yeah, there, there, there was a group that ends up, they own absolutely everything Sentinels of the Multiverse, have a spreadsheet where they log who played what hero against what villain, so they never repeat, and have gotten to the point where they're almost done, they have six more combos they haven't done, and are going to have to switch to the higher difficulty level and start the spreadsheet over, had no idea this version existed. So they were like, oh my god, you have a version of Mutants Mastermind we've never seen. Can we take this and play? And I'm like, do you know how to play? Because I read the rules once, and it's going to be a really rough teach, but I'll do it. They're like, no, no, we know exactly what we're doing. We own everything. <laughs> I'm like, ah, go for it. So they played it all night, and I guess it's great. They were like, oh, this is fantastic. It, it's. They said it was halfway to second edition, because I guess there's like a revised essential, some, some new version of Sentinels of the Multiverse. Right. Whereas this game was like, 2.5 it's like it's not that but it's way better than the revised edition or whatever so that was neat i got to play some stuff um started off with tapple we were everyone was just standing around waiting for food so that that just at the beginning everyone's like well i don't want to start something because i have food coming so i'm like here and i threw tapple in the middle of a table that went well enough for um a couple rounds but like as soon as one person's food came out, they're like, all right, let's put Tapple away. <laughs> um, the biggest hit of the night, big surprise for me, was Click Clack Lumberjack, which I just happened to grab. I don't, I don't even know why I grabbed it, but I haven't played my copy of Click Clack Lumberjack. Uh, Click Clack Lumberjack is a Korean game that has been rethemed a million different times. And it's all about making this tree 
with bark on it and you hit it with a plastic axe and the goal is to hit the pieces just hard enough that the bark falls off and you don't want to collect the cores man did well like, like people were loving that. <laughs> that that was the the what's that what are they playing i get to hit things with an axe and it just kind of baffled me because the week the month month previous i brought a riffraff I'm like, Riff Raff has a gimbal and this boat that's swinging everywhere. And like, I figured people in it, no one wanted to play Riff Raff. I basically forced two people to play Riff Raff. And they're like, no, no, I, I don't like having the reaction trying to catch things. But Click Lock Lumberjack, huge hit. See, so got me, it. there's that a makes, game I dusted off. Makes total sense to me. Um, Riff Raff is a, a focused, you know, you got to be, you got to be in the moment. You got to be fixated you gotta have the reaction time which doesn't go well with adult beverages whereas yeah. hitting a tree to knock knock things off that's right up there with drop it i mean i, I can totally yeah. see that uh th that going over uh and and being a big hit now that one i got videos of multiple different people hitting the stack so uh look forward to some shorts and possibly tiktok or reels we're trying to do more uh, videos, the the short form videos that are popular with the kids these days. Uh, we're trying to do more of that, and I got some good videos, so I, I'm, I'm you can look forward to seeing those. Um, boop! I finally had a boop failure. Um, a couple came in. Um, they were holding the game, and I went up, and I was like, "Hey, you interested in learning boop?" They're like, "Sure," and I'm like, "It's a game about cats bouncing on a bed." Uh, I can't say what they replied to that, but it had had to do with cats. And then we went back to the table and I taught them boop and they looked a little confused. Um, they seemed to have the basic rules. I sat down and I was in the middle of a game at the time and I continued playing that. And then I didn't even see any cats put up before they just wiped the board and put it away. Um, and then pulled out Ticket to Ride, which they had brought. Ticket to Ride, some version, I don't know, Marklin, I think. So I'm like, all right, whatever. I, I finally saw a boop failure. Um, that said though, another couple showed up later in the night who ended up being one of the employees who just brought their boyfriend out to have some drinks and were like, Oh, you guys are playing board games. And I showed them boop and they loved it and played six, seven rounds of boop. But we did finally see, I have seen boop is definitely not for everyone. Well, and you know, and if you show up expecting to and wanting to play TTR, boop is not ticket to no, ride. <laughs> it's not. So, uh, you're, you are definitely not getting the experience you were aiming for. If, if that's, yeah. if, you know, if that was your goal in coming out now, now thanks to this couple for, um, I don't know what you call welcoming in other people. And basically they played a two player game of ticket to ride, but then got others and played a big ticket to ride game. So fair enough. Again, people kind of did their own thing. It was nice. There was lots of people willing to teach games they brought, um, during a slow point, I said there was multiple times Ian and I, I'm like, Ian, you want to learn something new? And he's like, what do you got? So I showed him Kapow. Um, we played just the basic rules, which are okay. I, I much would have rather played with, with characters, but I wanted to show it off to him. Um, he had a good time. He, he dug it. He liked, he really liked the way the dice worked. Um, we definitely have a problem with one dice side that won't hold faces though. Um, which eventually you're just like, when the rest of that dies fold, you're like, well, the blank obviously equals this. So that's a little disappointing to find, but he did dig the game. Um, he's going to try to get it in at the store because he thinks it'll do well because they have a good working relationship with Wise Wizard. It's easy to get Wise Wizard stuff. So Ian, Doug Kapow, I enjoyed teaching again. I'm getting a little better at, at getting across what you need to watch for and what you should do as opposed to just hear mechanically how it works. Uh, next up was some Star Realms, and this is funny. So I played Star Realms with Gwen, who had played before, and we're playing. Ian's walking around, doing his thing, being host. And he looks over and he's like, wait a minute, I've never seen that Federation ship. Is that new art? Wait, what's that about? I what the, what card is this? And then I'm like, um, I'm like, it, it's Star Realms, Ian. It's it's the Frontiers version, came out, I think, 2019. It's not new, new, but it's it's the latest box set. He's like, wait, a box set. I'm like, yeah, it's a four-player starter set. He's like, a four-player version? A Star Realms? I thought it was two player only. I'm like, no, nah, there's always been rules for playing multiple players. Most people played it solo, like two player. He's like, oh, that's really cool. And he's like, wait, I haven't seen that either. And I'm like, he's like, is this all new cards? I'm like, yeah, it's a completely new deck. I don't remember, 80 cards, whatever comes in Star Realms. He's like, I got to get this. And I'm like, not only that, this is the solo and cooperative version. He's like, what? Solo, cooperative <laughs> Star Realms? And he was freaking out, like, like, like literally freaking out. He's like, I got to get this. And then he took pictures of the box from every side so that he could bring it back to Jeremy and be like, how come we don't have this in the store? 
So that was kind of amusing. I don't even remember who won the game. I just <laughs> remember how shocked Ian was that like there's a version of Star Realms I didn't know. Um, next, Telestrations, 12-player party pack with five players. I have owned my eight-player version of Telestrations for, I don't know, going back before the first ever Extra Life event, back when Brimstone Games was in um, Old Castle. No, it wasn't even Old Castle, wherever they were, McGregor. Um, and the markers still work in that game. The 12 player party pack I brought with 12 markers in it. We played with five players because that's all the markers that we could get to work. By the time we went around the table once, we were passing markers to each other to share the game. By the end of the night, we had three markers left out of 12. So I don't know the op when you switched, like who makes your markers or what, or that's like my eight player. Literally, I can go grab it right now and draw with. So a disappointing round of Telestrations because Telestrations with five players, which ended up going down to four because of the markers, four players is just not enough to play that game. Like the game shouldn't even say it's playable <laughs> without at least five. Um, yeah, some fun. And I mean, but, like, there's, there's no reason that markers should be like that. I mean, although they are the they are the thinner marker on yeah, the 12-player the pack. You almost need to keep some uh, some rubbing alcohol in there to try and regenerate them, uh, you know, when they die. But you shouldn't have to do that yeah. every time you pull out the game. No. And then, uh, so we've actually ordered <laughs> a new set, one with a, you know, everyone will have a different color next time, and and you know, some nice, good brand branded uh, markers for telestrations. So play telestrations. Uh, I tried to get some videos. I don't know how that turned out. Um, and then we were dumb because then Gwen broke out monstrosity which uses markers and we're like, damn, we're dumb. Why didn't we grab the markers from monstrosity? But anyway, uh, Gwen hosted ran three player game of monstrosity, which I don't know if the box says you're supposed to play three players, but we did run into a rule problem. So part of the game is you vote on who you think drew the best monster and you can't vote for yourself. And with only two players, that means you point at each other and you each get a point because you tied. And while the fact that Monstrosity should just be a party game and no one cares about the points, the points are completely broken with only three players. Like they don't work at all. Um, but I don't. Yeah, I, I'm going to look. It, it up is right three now. to eight. Uh, it the is community three to eight, says so four yeah. to eight. The community says four to eight plus. But yes. uh, the listing says three to eight. So yeah, uh, if you were going to play with points, you can't play it with three. Like it just doesn't work. Like if you if you're going to play Monstrosity, which I totally get, play it without caring who wins. That's fine. But if you want to mark score, if you care about who's going to win the game, don't play with three. It just doesn't work. The scoring system is completely broken. Uh, that is from Gwen, though. I, I will admit I didn't reread the rules. Maybe there's a two-player variant somewhere in there that I missed. Uh, that's still an awesome game. Like, it, like The premise is just so good. So someone draws a card, and it's got a funky-looking monster on it. Most likely drawn by the Miko, it ends up, because almost half the cards hmm. are there. So so then um, you look at the card for 20 seconds, you put the card down, you describe the card like uh, you were a witness that saw the monster doing a crime uh, for two minutes. Then everyone reveals their drawings and you vote on who you think best matches the card. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's I didn't play that one, but like it's always a big hit. Um, I did catch Gwen teaching Drop It during the night. Um, I saw her and Brenda playing games of Drop It and that couple I mentioned who would come in, the, the one staffer. Um, and, and, one, and a fanboy of mine and ends up cause I got over there and he's like, wait, your name's Mo, right? And I'm like, yeah. And you have some kind of like French name that starts with T and I'm like, yeah. And he's like, okay, you, you do the board game thing. And I'm like, yeah, I'm I, like, yeah, look, <laughs> that, that's what, that's what, that's what I'm doing. He's like, wait, something else. You do something else. I'm like, ah, and I wander away. I come back. He's like, I know it. you're the food guy. <laughs> well, that was kind of funny. And ends up this person has been like my friend on Facebook for 16 years. <laughs> following all the stuff I do and once came out to one of our game nights at the green bean downtown. <laughs> and that's the only time they ever made it out, but they always meant to be coming out. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, there was a bigger group playing um, party games, like the silly party games, you know, pick the card and laugh about it, exploding kittens, that kind of stuff. Um, they were doing their own thing. I was letting them do their own thing. There was a couple who had just moved down from Sudbury. I happened to overcatch part of that conversation. First event out, they were having a good time. Um, at the end, they're like, okay, do you have anything that plays 11 players? So they said, younger group, rather big. And I'm like, oh, Psycho Babble. I, again, huge hit. This did not have the boop effect. Everyone loved it. Um, 
the one thing we did find, um, I, I only did one round. I did the thing where I, I played the therapist once and hosted the first round, taught everyone how to play. Um, what I did do is I kept going back to make the deck for the host. Like, you know how you have to like sort the cards yeah, to make yeah. the deck just so they didn't screw it up. So I'm like, just flag me down when you're done around and I'll make the deck for you. Because yeah, I don't you, know, that, that I, breaks I the think, game. That that if if that if, deck if is wrong, wrong, the game is completely broken. Yeah. So I was doing that part for them but not taking part otherwise. Saw a very fun transition from how detailed people were being. But my fear of the therapist winning all the time at higher player counts. I guess is counteracted by adult beverages because if you're the therapist and you've had enough to drink, you forget what people have said and forget what questions you even asked. And it makes it really hard to remember who said what and figure out what everyone's talking about. So it ends up psycho babble is one of those games that the later in the night you play it in a bar, the more difficult the game gets and the easier it is for the inmates. Fair enough. Then we learn something new every time. Uh, but yes. I mean, yeah, Psycho Babble is such a fantastic game, and it's not surprising that uh, that it was a hit there, especially in that uh, the adult beverage uh, format. Mm -hmm. And it was great because these people who were playing the more popular party games enjoyed this enough that they're like, I think this was more fun than some of those As lighter, be. sillier, <laughs> random party games. Yeah, as it should be. That made me happy. Uh, overall, it, it was a good night. Um, I, I, it went well. There, there was a table playing heavy games. There were heavy gamers. Charles showed up. He taught uh, Glory to Rome. Um, th there was the usual mix. Uh, I, I don't know. It was a good night. Next, vacation gaming. Uh, we took a trip out to Blenheim and the Red Barn Brewery, which is uh, still a great place. Fantastic beer. Great vibe. Like one of the best patios I've ever been at. Um, and I taught Deanna Kapow because we were sitting outside. So um, we played twice. We played the base mats and then with heroes and villains. Um, I played the character that can stop time and D played a big damage dealer. I'm terrible at names. <laughs> sorry. Um, D had a kicker where she could take one damage to deal six, um, which, oh my God, she was smoking me like, like 20% of my health was gone the first turn of the game. Uh, but the time stop character has this really neat ability to lock powers so they go off automatic automatically every round and i think i played it really well that that was my goal the first three turns was to lock in three things which is the maximum and once i was powered up i took it in the end but i it, it was dicey d felt like i destroyed her in the end but i still felt like if i hadn't gotten those locked in if my dice didn't fall the right way she was going to destroy me before i got going so again, dig in the game. Once you add characters, I, I, the base mat feels like superhero Yahtzee. It, it's who rolled better, who was luckier. Right. Once you throw in the heroes and you're drafting dice based on the actual powers of the heroes, and uh, it, it's, I'm, I'm digging the game. So you would have been playing Time Out while Dean yes. would have been playing Victor Kane. There you go. I, I sure. <laughs> Time Out. I remember seeing at the top of my board. This is the problem when you put out a game that's not based on an established license. I'm like, I don't know. I, I like fun uh, OC heroes. So, yeah, <laughs> totally get it. Um, so the one thing though, patio, right? So I'm like, okay, dice game, no cards. This should be great for outside. Uh, the wind says no, <laughs> especially the screen problem. You wouldn't realize how hard it is to hold up your screen and roll six to seven dice and place them with one hand while you're trying to hold your screen with your, with the other, like, right. So, so it ends up, um, despite the fact that it was more it, it, like should be weatherproof. If there is any wind, unfortunately, you're going to need to play inside. That's unfortunate. And you get uh, little play, weighted, a, weighted bags or something to hold down something. Your... And, and even like the little plastic faces for the dice are light. Cause they're, here's your complaint. The complaint you had said, some people mentioned the dice are light. They're light enough to blow in the wind. Oh, wow. Okay. So are, so are the little uh, faces that you put on them. Um, played quite a bit of Star Realms, uh, multiple rounds at the Grow Brewing Company. Um, then more games the next day on the patio at Bandagoo. Still loving Star Realms. What I, what I need to do and we haven't been doing is we're just playing two-player. Like, we're still just digging the new cards. It's still refreshing and new. And still Star Realms and intimately familiar. And it's one of those games that now Deanna and I have played so many rounds of it. That it's casual enough. It's like playing Racco. 
even though it's playing Star Realms because we played so much, right? right. We're just yep. like, yeah, and I buy two cards and we're chatting and we're talking about other stuff. Uh, what I need to do is I need to dive into the campaign and solo stuff more. Not the campaign, the um, I can't remember what it's called. The 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 cooperative and solo, and then there's the champions. Uh, see, this is this is why detailed show notes sometimes help more. <laughs> Whatever it's called, the giant cards that you battle against. We haven't tried many of those, so so I think that's the next step with that. Um, did not play Racco. Uh, despite the fact that I had a Facebook memory come up today and say no trip to the county is complete. Well, I guess it was incomplete because we did not play Racco. But there was a copy of Yahtzee in our room, which just amused me because it's like everyone who ever played, instead of throwing them out, just left their score sheets in the box. And there were tons of them, like not hundreds, but like there had to be a pile of 20, 30 score sheets in there, which is kind of amusing. I'm like, wow, it's cool. People are actually using it, right? A, a form like, of box stopping. This. Yes. Yeah, basically. So, so, yes, we played a round of Yahtzee. Yahtzee's not terrible. No, but um, did you play, now did you play a single round or did you play a triple Yahtzee, like a, a game no, of no, triple? No, just no, a, just a single round of oh, Yahtzee. See, Yahtzee. See, to me, you, you, Yahtzee, a single round of Yahtzee is no fun. You've got to play the triple and have the, and be able to, you know, spread spread out across the three. Yeah, no, we just, we just played the standard, you know, double check the rules. There are rules in Yahtzee I forgot about. I'm trying to think of what they were. The big one was if you Yahtzee more than once. I didn't know that rule. Oh, it was if you fill in more than so many spots on the top half, you get a bonus 36 points. Yeah. I totally forgot that rule. But um, once we ended, uh, we compared our score sheets to others. We played better than most people. But, man, there are some, some I don't know, Yahtzee masters out there <laughs> or really damn lucky people. I'm not sure which <laughs> which it was, but I'm like, Wow, I, I, we got 200 and something, and you got 300 and something, and someone here has got six. I'm <laughs> like, how did you do that? Um, we played three rounds of Point Salad uh, that happened to be over at the Grove Brewery. Still digging Point Salad. We did the whole two-player thing where, where you play, like you split the deck in threes, yeah, and then you play three rounds and told your points. So we did the Yahtzee thing, but we did it with Point Salad, I guess. <laughs> Still digging that one. Um, the big one that I think people want to hear about though is distilled. I uh, broke this out at the red lantern um, I, coffee roasters. I think is their full name. Red lantern coffee roasters. Dig that place. Unfortunately only open till three or four. Um, the bad part was I, I did the unboxing video for this, which we'll probably put out pretty soon, but I hadn't punched the game and it comes with nice deluxe green trays inserts. Um, but remember two episodes ago and us talking about how one of the best quality of life things is something in the box top or something included in the box that tells you what goes where. Yeah, that's not in distilled at all. Mm. There is a diagram from, from game trays that first of all, tells you the thing that I'd never actually seen in a game, but I say as a pro tip all the time to take your, your punch boards and put them on the bottom because that pushes up your inserts so that it's still flush with the lid. That was actually in here. So it's the first time I've ever actually seen a board game recommend doing that inside. And it shows you what order to put the trays in, but not what goes in the trays. And I, I can't remember if I shared it online, but I took a picture of us trying to sort this game. And there's just a lot. There, There's all <laughs> kinds of labels and there's all kinds of cards. and So tray A goes on tray B, cards. which goes next to tray C on top of tray D. But you, it's up to you what you put in any of that shit. <laughs> yes. And eventually I found a video from the designer of the game who said, you're free to put what you want where, but here's how I do it. Which I'm like, no, just tell me how to do it. <laughs> like, please, at least give me the optimum way. Well, I suppose I, they're, they're trying to sort of hedge their bets there because some people, if they say this is how you do it, someone will guaranteed say, oh, you're wrong. It's way better if you do it this way. Yeah. So then they're just sort of foregoing that problem and saying, do it however you want. It's up to you. I guess. I, I still would have much rather had a picture of here's how we prefer to sort the game, though you may be able to find a better way or something. Yeah. yeah. Next problem, you've been to Red Barn. You know how big those tables are. Mm -hmm. They're not huge. They're not like my gaming table, but they're not small. Oh, my God. Is this game a table hog? Oh, I totally did not. I, I don't even know how the guy gave us a demo at the table he had it at. There must have been stuff that was not in play because there's multiple boards out. So there's. Your player boards, which are significant, like bigger than Terraforming Mars, large player boards. There's a scoreboard, which takes up a surprising amount of stuff. 
There's what they call the market truck. So there's this truck that you stack discards on. There's the standard market that's ridiculously long. It's almost twice the length of a player board. You're then going to lay out three rows of cards that are the deck plus three cards. You're going to have a place to put your money that's in three denominations. You've got your recipe cubes in three denominations. There's just stuff everywhere. I'm like, it basically took up an entire table at Red Lantern. And then the second game we played, we played it at the Sandwich Brewery, and we had to put two tables together to get this to fit. And this is two players. This is just DNI. And I. And the game, to give I think, it, plays five. And for an example, when we played Castellans at uh, at the the, the Red, Red Lantern, at the Red, yeah, Red, the Red Lantern, Lantern um, we had three players of Castellans plus like rule books spread out and boxes mm -hmm. open and on the table. I mean, we we kind of took all the space we could take. Um, really, we, we weren't neat about it. Um, yes. and still, and you know, we we used that table. So it's a it's a sizable chunk of it table is. you get there. Yeah, yeah. I I was a little shocked. I didn't realize that. <laughs> not a good bar or coffee table, coffee shop game. Despite the fact we yeah, played they clearly it at did a bar not have it all out on shop. that demo then because that 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 demo table was tiny. Yeah, it wasn't that big, right? Like I, I'm trying to I'm trying to picture what they had out. I don't know. I, I had to look through my origins pictures and see yeah. if I can if I took a shot of that. Like, I know he didn't do a full game. It was a quick demo anyway. All right. One of the things this had. So so we've got one quality of life improvement that it gave me. I will say the, the game trace inserts are nice. They're branded. It looks like a barrel. It looks like a whiskey barrel. The the, the trays are great for holding the resources. Um, Everything's the, the spots to hold the the player pieces. They're They're all uniquely shaped as well as colored. And they actually match the player boards. Like, like and then the... Clipboard is dual layered. Like it did almost all of the quality of life, including an onboarding book, which was fantastic. It, it was a very well done onboarding book where it gives you a standard market to lay out in the middle. So you have a standard setup. Everyone has set characters and then it walks you through and it looks like the book's fairly thick. It's literally only one turn. So one turn of the game where it literally said, you buy this, then you buy this, then you buy this, then you buy this. But it was like, you buy this because your character specializes in this and you want a long-term plan to do this. You're going to buy this because by time to turn two, you want to distill your unique proof. And you are going to take this because, and it explained why you're doing all this stuff. And by doing that teaches you every possible option in the game. But when you're only playing two players, you only see two players worth of options. So like then we're partway through the turn and it's like, you'll note that Sweden doesn't have this. And I'm like, no, because we're playing two players. There's no Sweden here. So it was well done, but it was awkward. Like, like, I don't know. I don't know how you do it better though. Like it's set up for a five player game. If you have less than five players, do you have, like, do you set up all five and have everyone play multiple characters? So it's like, like almost awesome onboarding. So what I ended up doing with Deanna, and I don't know how well it worked for her, she is not good at learning by me reading. So I think a lot of it wasn't sinking in anyway, because that's just not how she learns. Is that the player teaching, say, if Sweden was playing, they would have done this. If Japan was playing, they would have done this. To maybe at least get to those outliers. Yeah, that's uh, that's an odd one. I You almost kind of... Wait want to set all, set them all up and and play them all and just sort of like everyone right yeah everyone does it uh even if you're you know again you're you're only playing one turn anyway um but then as d says it was an easy game to pick up anyway it's not hard i i i, I would say probably wingspan level of difficulty but man the the decisions but anyway i'll, I'll get to that in a second so so we played our first game learning game it was neat um the theme is really tied in um, I was surprised by how much it plays like Brewcrafters, the travel card game, which you played mm -hmm. with the whole, you're trying to collect different ingredient cards, and then you're going to take your ingredient cards to fulfill a recipe. And that felt very similar. You're literally buying ingredients, except you're also buying a bottle to put them in and something to age them in, or not even age, but, but something to brew them in. Sorry, I should say, because sometimes you age some, you don't. The trick, though, that it's not in Brew Crafters is you never know if it's going to work in this game. So you have to create, grab at least water, you have to grab at least yeast, and then you're going to grab at least one sugar. Until you have those things, you can't brew anything. And in this game, you are going to brew one thing 
every turn of the game and the game's only seven turns. You're only going to ever brew seven things. And if you ever fail at brewing completely, you played wrong. Like you, you want to brew something every turn. So you need those three basic ingredients, but then you're going to take those ingredients. You're going to add in alcohol based on the number of sugars you have. You're going to shuffle that hand, lose the top card and the bottom card, and then look at what you're left with. And basically all it's, all you're looking for at the beginning of the game is, do you have any sugars left? If you have no sugars left, you brew moonshine. If you have sugars left, you brewed vodka. Now you can also then learn other ingredients where like uh, gin requires a metal ton and at least two plant sugars to be able to, gen or sorry, gin was um, fruit sugars specifically. And I'm not going to get into how, how to play the game, but that whole mash thing with the top and bottom. Now, what I didn't realize is I'm not a distiller. Um, but I guess that's what you really do is they call it the mash. You mash all this stuff in your giant ton, and then you bleed off the, uh, the top and then you, you suck out the bottom, which is called bottom and topping, which I realize there's other connotations to that. Well, that's what you're doing with your deck, right? You're shuffling it, you're mashing it all together and moving the top and the bottom. And I just, that thematic tie-in was really cool. There were some other interesting thematic tie-ins, like while you, everything you bottle your stuff in, you then make a glass collection that you save and you put off to the side on your shelf to show off the cool glasses you've made. And that's a little set collection thing. I just, the whole thing just seemed really neat. And I really liked the, the mash thing. You could take risks. You could be like, I'm going to try to brew gin and I'm only putting two fruit sugars in my entire deck. Well, if one of those is the top or the bottom, you're going to fail at making gin and end up making vodka. Or you can make sure to put in four fruit sugars. That way, no matter what, even if you got a fruit on the top and the bottom, you're still going to make gin no matter what. And I liked that you had that. You're like, you could push yourself or not. And the amount of um, asymmetry, there are a ridiculous number of characters in this game. I didn't count it, but it's got to be like 20 or 30 different regions of the world. And everyone has its own unique recipe. So that was really cool. There's whatever H, what's that get you to? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. So there's eight different tasting boards that you can play with and that's the different booze that's in that game that you can brew so you can mix and match those i just really neat game interesting i'm looking forward to, to trying that as much as i'm not a not a drinker uh that one that one speaks to me more than uh the bavarian drinking tour <laughs> yeah belgian beer race fair enough fair enough uh, what was amazing is the first game. Yes, it, it led us through the first turn. You're playing seven. So we deviated. We both tied. And I'm like, we just played this. So it's half an hour per player once you know the game, which sound, seems pretty accurate so far. But that first game was two hours long. So we just played a two hour long. And again, I'm going back to those buckets. Euro game where like we're fighting like this barrel gives me one point or two if it matches the region of my booze. So it's not like we're scoring, you know, 25 points every time. We're scoring two, three. I scored six. Okay, I made my signature brew. I actually got 23 points. Oh, wait, it's 22 because of this. And and our end score after seven rounds, we were exactly tied. We had over 100 points, nickel and diming it, right? Like, in this game, I've noticed you tend to have, like, two to three big batches. But everything else, like, yeah, I get about six. Yeah, I get about four. I get a couple bonuses here. Yeah, I've got whatever. I've got 15 bucks left at the end of the game. That's worth three points. I couldn't believe we tied. The tiebreaker, I ended up winning. Second time we played, using the standard rules, everything randomized. I got to say, when you first start, it is really hard to get that direction. So I now totally get why the onboarding is written as it is. Because it basically tells you, you look at the goals you have in your hand and look at this and look at this and 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 form this long-term strategy and you're going to buy these things towards it. Cause without that, I was like, what do I do with all this stuff? All right. I picked a character. I'm from Jamaica. Um, my specialty is a rum. I spent the first three turns getting ready to brew my special rum without noticing it has to be aged and I didn't have any barrels. Mm -hmm. So like man playing it all randomized was hard. And then you're like, what do I do? Do I lean into the fact that because I'm from Jamaica, any glassware I buy costs one less? Or do I work towards my personal goals? You get three randomized personal goals at the beginning. And one of my randomized goals is brew Asian beer, Asian booze. Well, on the recipe card, there's two Asians, 
but both of them require this like um, clay pot to to age them in, and that's not anything that goes with my character. Or do I do this other one where I want to have the most money left over at the end? Or there's these things called spirit awards, which are dropped from the onboarding version. So again, great onboarding, right? Skip part of the game. Don't even put it in there for your first play. Spirit awards are one of those first to get it claims it. Should I work towards those? Or should I do something completely different? It was just so different than that first onboarding game. I was like, wow, there is a lot more going on in this game than I thought. So yeah, digging it so far, I, I think it's be better with more than two, though it played great with two. I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm glad it works as two as well as, uh, you know, seeing more folks in there too as well. So Roger's calling out from the chat and I've heard this obsession is, is from the same designer. You like Distilled, but like Obsession more. They both have a similar type vibe to them. I have not played Obsession, obviously. All right, to not make this go too long, um, the other thing we did is Dyson Logos, the, the mapper extraordinaire, came in to Windsor. Um, we met at um, Armando's in Amherstburg, and Dean Lister, one of the best pizza chefs in all of Canada, was working. We got some slices. Uh, the rain didn't break, so that was nice. We went down to the Navy Yard Park in, in Amherstburg. This is a beautiful park. Ate some pizza. They were duly impressed. Um, then we drove to Cava. Uh, and we played some point salad, and it was a huge hit. And it was nice because Dyson is a war gamer. He he um, literally had played championship level Risk, and um, has won competitions for um, Risk twenty one eighty nine. I, I don't remember the exact version. Um, was telling us all about his strategies in this particular version of Risk, and and one of his uh, calls to fame was uh, by turn two, I can generally predict with ninety percent accuracy who's going to win a game of Risk. Um, also into war games. So he's newer to, to hobby board games and isn't so great on the Euro thing. So point salad was perfect. It was just enough. Um, his girlfriend, Jess, also is fairly new to hobby board games and was a little intimidated by all the icons on point salad. But like we played three rounds in a row, went over extremely well. Point salad, big hit. Um, it is such a great welcoming game. It is. It, it's, it's a it, it, it's it got a lot there. It, I can see how someone could look at it and go, oh, this is scary. But again, you know, 30 seconds later, you're like, oh, never mind. Then here, give me all the, all yeah. your uh, your eggplant. I'm going to, you know, um, or yeah, I know there's no eggplant in there, but cucumbers or something. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and we had the thing where we finished the first game and Dyson's like, okay, now that I get it, let's play again, which is always good to see as yeah. someone introducing someone to a game. Um, then we broke out Deadlies, which I don't know how much we talked about Deadlies yet. This is a smirk and dagger, might be smirk and laughter or whatever. Smirk I don't think and, we've actually talked about it on the show at all yet. I know we mentioned that we played it. That we might have talked about it in our Origins episode. I, I think we mentioned that we played it, but I don't think we ever actually discussed it. Okay, so Deadlies is, um, I hate saying gamers anything because it sounds gatekeepy, but I'm going to say it, Gamers Uno, or Uno for Gamers. It is a void your hand card game where you are trying to play all the cards from your hand and to win the round uh though in this particular game you don't win the round what happens is you have a little life counter that starts at six. First time you void your hand you turn it to four you get four new cards next time you void your hand you turn it to two you get two new cards then the next time you void your hand you go to zero and you you win the game so it's the first person to void their hand three times that wins which is awesome because then there's no score keeping there's no uno rounds and there's no player elimination so that's one of the things it does right and then the entire theme of this game is the deadlies are the seven deadly sins, and the deck are the seven deadly sins, and there are seven cards of each seven deadly sin, numbered one through seven. And then there are two special cards. There is an eight, which counts as any of the sins, and then there is a zero, which is purity, which lets you collect this halo card that lets you instantly win the round if you can get it played. And then each of the sins does something different. Again, not a full review, so I'm not going to get into it, but there's like greed, where you're going to play random cards to other players, and if you play two of the same type of card, you pick them all up. Otherwise, everyone else picks up the cards. There's pride where you ask someone else, are you prideful? And if they have a pride card, they reveal it. And then you have to draw a card. If they don't, they have to draw a card. There's um, whatever, all the different sins, gold to empty your hand. And the neat part in this that I've yet to see in a game, and I'm sure it's probably out there with hearts and spades and standard playing cards, is when you play your cards, you can play either a straight one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or just five, six. And whatever cards, the highest number goes off. So I could play one, two, three, four, but I have gluttony on top. So gluttony is the power that goes off. But I got to get all of those cards out of my hand. 
or you can play all the kind. So I could play six sevens and then I choose which of the sevens would be on the top of my deck. And that's what would go off. And I thought that was a brilliant way to play cards. Like I just really enjoy the feel of getting to play this stack of cards out of my hand because I happen to have a straight draw the same number. Yeah, no. And, and, and the, the, once you get used to them, all the different sins uh, are really fun. They really make it yeah. an interesting and, and fun game to play. I, we played that several times uh, at Origins, and it was just really enjoyable to play, uh, you know, even as a, a lighter sort of, you know, friendly, introductory, friendly mm -hmm. uh, gamers game. Uh, it was still a, a fun game to play, you know, sitting around at a bar. And then the, the one good sign from this one is when we sat down and they're like, oh, you're grabbing games. Dyson's like, Jess doesn't really like competitive games. She prefer we were on the same side or doing kind of multiplayer solitaire. We finished Deadly. She's like, okay, maybe I like competitive games. <laughs> so that was a good sign. And I'm like, it's a different kind of combat. It's, it, I don't know. Like you get the silly light take that games and there's no bad feelings and there's no, I, yeah, I screwed you over, but then you screwed me and then I screwed her and she screwed him and we're all screwing each other. And then you know, when there's no bad feelings, right? There's no overly competitive. And I think that's the secret to that type of game. That's the stuff Smirk and Laughter tends to get right. And they did a great job on this one. Uh, last game played was Birds of a Feather. Um, again, realizing what type of games they enjoyed playing. I went for something light. We went to Sandwich Brewery. Um, Dyson got to try three local beers. We got a, a small charcuterie spread. And we played Birds of the Feather, which we've talked about quite a bit recently on the show. I don't know. We just reviewed it, didn't we? Yep. Did we review this yeah, one? Yeah, week. I thought so. Yeah, we just reviewed this one last week, so you can listen to that. Uh, again, it was a hit. We all downloaded the app. We used the score tracker. It went well. Um, Dyson's only complaint is he's never coming back to Windsor because we don't let him win because he lost every single <laughs> game we played all day. <laughs> but other than that, he had Fair. a good time. Um, we did wrap up at the high mat, but no gaming there. And go to the high mat if you're in Windsor. Place has fantastic food. We are. We already talked about the schnitzel. <laughs> yep, we talked about schnitzel. All right, well, how about the coming weeks? Anything specific planned? Uh, not really. Um, there's lots to get done before we head out of town. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a dedication for my dad this weekend. Uh, so the next time I'm going to be gaming, it'll probably be something like Telestrations with my aunt and uncle on their farm. Um, I am going to bring Point Salad because um, I tried to introduce them to Bean. And as I was talking, I said that they're into very quick-to-learn games. And to me, Bean seems simple. But when you've not played anything like that, there's a lot of explanation to Bean and no, you can't sort your cards and why you might want to do things. So I'm hoping to um, redeem myself from <laughs> recommending Bean last time and it not going so well with bringing Point Salad. I think that'll be the right complexity level. And while I may also pack some stuff for D or I to play with the kids, I think D would probably like it if I bring Distilled. Right now it's, you know, it's the new hotness. We're like, oh, I'm digging this. I'm we're still figuring out strategies. We're still finding ways to play, and we've only ever played with the one tasting board so far. Um, as for once we get back, I don't even want to think about that until we get back. So, so like right now, um, I think I mentioned the coffee break. I do have something I think I'm going to try to unbox before we go, but I don't know if we'll get to it. And um, that'll be for our puzzle fans more so than our board game fans, though there's supposed to be a game element to it. All right, fair enough. Well, let's uh, move on then. Before we start locking things down, let's take a moment to thank a selection of our Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patrons. Their support has kept this go show going for more than five years and hopefully for much more to come. Sean P. Kelly. Thank you, Sean. You came up in conversation today. Derek Hisson. Thanks, Derek. Andrew Dacey. Thank you, Andrew. The Misdirected Mark Podcast. Thank you. Donna, thank you, Pax, the Paladin. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, now with chapters. Keep the conversation going by joining us on the Tabletop Bellhop Discord at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. And please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that's all for us tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live. And be sure to stick around for the Penthouse Suite after show for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you.
And, and game, game on. on.